people of the internet, this is Andres Perez, a.k.a. Kaiju Noir, here with another episode of a Shuat Podcast. Today's guest is someone whose art you may be familiar with, especially if you've been around the Kaiju blog on DeviantArt. All the way from Seattle, it's Steve Tao, a.k.a. Raptor Gear from Winter and Gaia. Nice to meet everybody. And so, the fir- to first uh, start things off, what exactly is like the distinction between your username Raptor Gear online as well as your account's name Winter and Gaia? It's like um, for a while, I actually thought that your name was Winter and Gaia or Winter or Gaia until I noticed that you went by Raptor Gear in among other kaiju related forums. Yeah, well, the the, the um. Raptor Gear has always been kind of my screen name, and I've been using it since I was in high school. Uh-huh. But uh, Winter and Gaia itself is really more of a group team effort of me and a bunch of close friends. Um, usually, it's just me and my roommate. But once in a while, we do have other um, college mates that will eventually come visit and we'll get together and create projects such as... Um, Simple stories, animation projects, or eating times, just um, throwaway projects, just for the sake of fun. Okay, then. So, but for the most part, it's, um, when it comes to the artwork presented on that DeviantArt account, it's mostly from you? That is correct. Um, uh, We all have, like, different um, prime jobs that we do. Example would be uh, my roommate, his name is uh, Albert uh, Laguno. Mm -hmm. He... uh, He's the one that normally handles the story work, the character creation. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not as as me for me. It's more of I'm just an artist, and uh, there's a certain a lot of concept ideas that I could usually I can bring up to the table. But um, mm. it, that's usually the case. Is the 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 art concept is um, usually me, but character creation and concept is um, Albert. We also have another female friend, but I'm not sure if. Uh, where she's at right now. I know that she uh, went overseas in London for a while, but mm-hmm. majority of the time she's a, a consultant for me when it comes to um, character fashion. Because mm-hmm. I, when it comes to fashion, especially with human characters, I'm kind of bad on it. But mm-hmm. uh, most of the time I usually at, go and uh, contact her and she'll pretty much inform me about um, certain fashions that certain characters should have, which is, I'm pretty sure everybody's seen a lot of my characters' um, fashion sense in my DeviantArt account. Mm-hmm. Okay, then. And so, where did the name Winter and Gaia came from? Interesting enough, Winter and Gaia was just kind of a throw-in throw concept that I came up with. Uh, my The original name I had was Winter on on Earth, and then mm-hmm. eventually it became Winter on Gaia. Mm-hmm. Then I honestly thought that was dumb as a, a group name, so I mm-hmm. decided to just call it Winter and Gaia, and that's pretty much where um, it stayed for pretty much uh, from 2006 until now. Okay, so Ga- <clears throat> Gaia came is the name <clears throat> of Mother Earth herself, and she's that's also the name of our mascot. So, right. and she's the blue-haired girl, right? That is correct. And I usually put, likes to portray her as like a teenager and kind of will, um, kind of lucky go free. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't really have much of a personality or a backstory, but mm-hmm. I pretty much use her as a uh, mascot within our uh, doujin circle or um, art circle. Okay, pretty much well, like what Draco Azul is for my channel as well. That is correct. Yeah. Like just, just not. But in your case, you actually use them as an avatar. But for Gaia, mm. she's never really a avatar. Um, mm. In most sense, she's just a mascot and right. um, just a symbol. Her concept, <laughs> yeah, and her concept is not really anything like. There's no deep meaning behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, she, I tend to use her for um, comedic sake because mm-hmm. uh, I do have a lot of. Um, um, SD drawings of her doing dumb, dumb things, and yeah. there's a certain. Um, my roommate has a musical blog that's called um, a Sound Upgrade, mm-hmm. and he uses those characters as well. So it's again, it's part of the same um, Winter and Gaia circle. So we pretty much um, have our own project sometimes, and mm-hmm. we do use these characters once in a while. Okay, then. And uh, is the Winter in Winter and Gaia also a character, or is that just part of the name? Oh no, she's she's a purple hair um, 
Hikimori character that just stays at home. Um, I haven't used her much on Deviant Art, uh-huh. mainly because it um, it's kind of hard to add her into a lot of drawings. Plus, uh-huh. it's kind of complicated because the character is a little more older and mm-hmm. it takes more time to actually draw her. And I'm kind of lazy. I'm, yeah. I'm a lazy artist, <laughs> as any, everybody can see. <laughs> or especially if you've seen a lot of my deviant art stuff, uh-huh. then you, you could tell I could do better. I just I'm just a lazy bastard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can use your full potential. You just don't want to. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, no, fuck it. I'm going chibi today. <laughs> Circles all around, just simple circles and round edges. Exactly, and that's kind of a, my my easy way of copying out. If if uh-huh. anybody wants to know why I end up ten or I tend to do a lot of the the lazy arts, it's yeah. mainly because I'm in a groove. But I'm just too lazy. <laughs> well, luckily, I think your chibi art, your chibi, your simplified chibi art is still just as appealing, in my opinion, especially with what you've <laughs> done you. here with your uh, recent title card that everyone is looking at. So definitely. So was it always the idea of having like what came for so the, the Winter and Gaia or like Winter and Earth. So the names came first and then you adapted the name into two characters? No, actually um I it po- started I apologize off... for the, I sorry guys. I apologize for the sirens. I don't know what's going on t- today. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Titanosaurus is attacking the town. <laughs> oh, well, it is nighttime over there, right? Oh no! It's actually uh, tw- uh, twelve, almost one o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> oh so wow! It, the Titanosaurus is up pretty early today. Maybe he got off the wrong side of the rock. I wouldn't be surprised. Then again, since you're in a countryside, maybe it might be Biolante. Maybe, or perhaps Baragon, as I, I've mentioned in some videos in the past. You know, maybe Baragon. He's just like hassling people. He's just razzling people around. <laughs> <laughs> if you notice, like, Baragon doesn't really kill people. He just screams at them really loudly. You're right. Now that I think about it, he he. the only thing he killed was, like, cattle, right? Yeah, cattle, chickens, maybe a horse. So you're trying to say that we humans are the bad per- bad ones, pretty much. We just started attacking him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after but all, no, to who, answer, who, who, uh, sorry, go yeah, ahead. No worries. Uh, yeah, to answer your question, um, the character actually came first. I, I drew the character um, mm-hmm. concept um, a while back. Uh, I think there's a few pictures of her with um, a green Lolita dress that uh-huh. pretty much, um, or I like to call her fairy dress. Uh-huh. That is the version three of the, her original concept. Um, uh-huh. So she came first, and I kind of drew that as a throwaway i was bored in um one of my college classes one day and Uh the professor was just so boring that you you'll just want to fall asleep so i've been there man trust me yeah so so my professor was so boring that everybody in in class started drawing as as a way to kill time so what i did was i pretty much did the same thing and and i started throwing in a bunch of concept and i decided you know, what if I just create a character that's based off of um, Earth? Don't ask how I came to that thought. I just suddenly mm-hmm. did. Um, but then again, maybe it's because I was in um, astronomy at the moment. It, oh. That was the class. Okay, then. Uh, and uh, let's see. And, and your... no, astronomy is not boring. It, it was just the way the professor was <laughs> Pre- presenting the, the data or that um, – all of us students had that was pretty much boring. Mm-hmm. Is that I'm a big giant um, stargazer. If you've seen a lot of my arts and a lot of my pictures online, then yes, I I love space. Yeah, actually, I'm looking at your account right now, and I do see something that is literally labeled stargazer. Exactly. Astronomy compels the souls to look upward and lead us from this world uh, into another. Sounds deep. Uh, yeah, but that's also a quote. I'm pretty sure I am. I'm positive I took it from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and where did the idea for having a character based on winter come from? The the weird thing is winter was um, how I did, came upon um, using winter was I'm a I'm not a summer guy. I love mm. the cold, so I love um, hanging out in colds, or I pretty much uh-huh. love the cold temperature. Uh huh. And at the same time, I think throughout my most of my life, um, 
of all the seasons, winter has always been the seasons where I felt more calm and more focused on my own self. Uh-huh. So that's pretty much where winter came from. It wasn't until probably 2010. Because mm-hmm. uh, Gaia itself uh, was a concept I had back in 2006. And that's yeah. pretty much when um, I decided to have winter in Gaia. Uh-huh. Or pretty much – or when I decided to uh, name our – circle our art circle uh, winter and gaia yeah and it wasn't until two, uh 2010 that um my my writer or the albert mm-hmm. he pretty much said you know why don't we just make her a, a character named winter and i sat there and i'm like you know i never thought about that i mean why not uh-huh and so he came in he he created this hikimori where she's pretty much um freeloads off of uh she kind of bums off um whoever uh gaia's house is um Mm -hmm. house is she just sits there plays um video games all day basically Uh he created this character because it was one of the easiest ways to write any kind of character just create a hikimori character Mm -hmm. you're limited in personality you're limited Uh in communication (laughs) you just focus on that one character it was it was pretty much his way of being lazy in terms of writing Right, right. That's all you're gonna. That's all you are, you're gonna be. That's all you ever will be. Yeah. <laughs> you just stay in your room and play your goddamn video games. So yeah, and, and most of most of our joke is pretty much um, uh-huh. making fun of um, you know the hikimori hikimori um, no, it, lifestyle. And for those who don't know the hikikomori, that those are like the Japanese versions of like your stereotypical shut-ins or hermits who stay indoors and do nothing but indulge in entertainment and anime and all that kind of stuff and never at- interact with the outside world, right? That is correct. Okay, yeah. Which I still find it odd how a lot of them could survive by themselves. It's just crazy. Well, here's the thing. A lot of these hikikomoris or these shut-ins, they are being supported by their parents and they uh, will... for a lot. The thing is, a lot of... Uh, Japanese parents will support their children through and through. It's not like in America where once you turn 18, out the door you go. Um, and so, Shoot, that, If I was a parent, that's the first thing I would do. It's like, once you're 18, yeah. you're an adult, get the hell out. <laughs> yeah. Instead, like the parents, they will just like uh, support them and spoil them no matter what happens, no matter how old they get. In return, they just pressure them into just, you know, working your ass off to get into a good high school so that you can get into a good college, so that you can get into a good um, salary man's job that you will stick with for the rest of your life until you eventually die of old age, retire, or die from a heart attack, or commit suicide. Because, hey, this is Japan. <laughs> As an Asian person myself, I that you, what you said is pretty much true with a lot of... Um, Mm-hmm. Asians that comes to even America, it's uh, that's my parents was very strict and mm. primarily my dad, and it was more of um, uh-huh. there's that typical um joke where it's like, look, uh, a parent a parent will say, look, uh-huh. I I I want you to pick your own choice. I'm not gonna hold you back, and you mm. can be whatever you want. And then they throw <laughs> as long the, as I approve. <laughs> no, no, and then they throw in the option: you're either gonna be a doctor or an engineer. That's it. <laughs> It's like you could be whatever you want. You're either gonna be a doctor or an engineer. It's like, uh, but you said I could be whatever I want. No, you can only be whatever you want by those two choices. <laughs> it's terrible. It's like, it's like, it's like I'm pretty sure a lot of um, your Asian listener could understand yeah. that stupid joke. Oh well, yeah, it's pretty much become like a reoccurring gag throughout like all of entertainment. You know, watch any sort of depiction of a stereotypical Asian family, and they'll be like, "How come you're not a doctor yet?" Dad, I'm only twelve. Give me all oh, the Family Guy joke. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Oh my god, I I was rolling so hard when I saw that. Part. Yeah. Although what's really ironic is that we had this idea that because their Asian parents tend to push their kids seemingly harder than anyone any other ethnicity, that we tend to think of like Asians in general as being like much smarter. Whereas ironically, in Japan, because everyone is relying on the older generation before them. They're not really all that smart. In fact, they're kind of almost lazy in a way because they just let their senpais do all the work for them, at least in the case of Japan, as I've come to learn. Because their their educational system, when it comes to universities, 
is kind of a joke because you can literally just like plagiarize off of your your senpai's work and you can get you can graduate scot free without really learning anything. Mm, that kind of sounds like how my uh, roommate's older sister um, graduated university over here. Oh, really? Now? Huh. Yes. And if you uh, have you heard of uh, Cal Poly Pomona? Yeah, she pretty much did that with her friends, and that's how she got or her degree damn <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm pretty sure it, it works anyway even it's not limited to just japan okay then yeah yeah <laughs> i just know that i've come to learn that if you get like a, a bachelor's or like a master's or doctorate in japan it won't hold the same value if you come to america with that sort of, with those sort of degrees because i guess america does not look all that look to very they don't really look at japan's educational system in that high of a regard even though it is technically a first world country and a lot of um foreigners from third world and second world countries co often come to japan solely for educational value wow uh, yeah as i come to learn because i live in gifu i live next to gifu university so i befriended a lot of uh, foreigners. University students, huh? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And a large majority of my friends are foreign students um, who have come here to attend Gifu University. But enough about me. Sorry about this. <laughs> Let's, back to you. Back to the real star of today's episode. Uh, so, yes. you uh, got into art, not as like a 100% like a, of a prof profession, but rather as sort of like a side hobby thing. Yes, um, I got into art uh, at a very young age, and it's primarily through my mom. Hmm. Um, when I was younger, and I guess I could also, this also goes to um, seeing my very first Godzilla movie as well, hmm. is when I was younger, probably third grade, um, she was flipping through the channel, and she realized that she, um, there was a, a movie that was playing. And then with my mom's yeah, typical – um, Asians like when you're flipping through the channel you mm -hmm. automatically will see a sh uh, Asian show and you'll sit there you'll pause mm -hmm. and then she'll sit there and put the controller down and just watch uh -huh. and um, I was a kid so I didn't really understand and um, it was a night party mm -hmm. that I was remember seeing then all of a sudden Godzilla shows up mm -hmm. and it, it took me years to actually find out that it was Ghidra the three-headed monster Okay, nice. Yeah. Remember that scene when Godzilla pretty much first time appears and there's that boat scene? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, they kind yeah. Of, that was the scene that was – they essentially like ripped off their uh, – Toho ripped off their own scene by doing just that in Frankenstein Conquers the World. Yeah. Um, when I first saw um, – my first time – or if I could remember how um, I saw Godzilla was, yeah. I remember there was uh, – the, some characters talking and then all of a sudden um, my mom stopped and she started watching it and that's when I saw Rodan's big giant um, you know black that one scene with Rodan just coming down from the the sky while it's dark and then Godzilla rising up yeah. that was my first that was my first introduction to Godzilla and I didn't see Godzilla all I yeah. saw was a pterodactyl and I saw a, dino, a tyrannosaurus thing yeah, yeah. and I got I got stuck there because I'm pretty sure a lot of kaiju fans mm -hmm. are big, giant dinosaur nerds. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was you know, as a child, me. you love dinosaurs. And Hell, yeah. That, that was one thing for me. It's I love dinosaurs. Uh -huh. So I sat there, and I started watching, and it was all new. It's like, it's like why is the dinosaur breathing smoke? I mean, it wasn't <laughs> fire then. It was all smoke for me. That's very true. They, they did that in Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster. And then and, and, um, that's when I started seeing everything. And that was my first introduction to a Godzilla movie without realizing it was a Godzilla movie. Nice, nice. Um, and during that time, I started trying to draw Godzilla, but I was drawing him more like the original depiction of a uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, which, you know, there there's more standing upright. Oh, like the tripod stance? Kind of, yeah, where their tail is low, like a kangaroo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so that's pretty much how I drew dinosaurs. And then my mom came to me and she's like, you know what? I'll show you how to draw. And so she started drawing her variation of dinosaurs, mm -hmm. which when I was younger, mm -hmm. looked it cool. As I grew older, I realized they look a little too human for my taste. <laughs> hmm. 
but no, my, yeah, there you go. My my first introduction to drawing and as as well as Godzilla was all in the same, and it's mainly from my mom just happened to catch Godzilla on some weird channel. Uh huh. I see. And so, is your mother uh, also an artist by trade or as a hobby, as like you? Uh, it's again, it's more of um a hobby, but she she tends to draw more um more flowers and garden which is pretty much the reason why i have a lot of flowers and gardens in some of my drawings okay then so in that case um oh yeah so going ahead uh did you ever get any sort of further uh education in art or like did you ever took any classes or or any kind or was it all self-taught um, no, I've actually went through a few classes in high school. Um, mm-hmm. We, I, I was actually one of those uh, fortunate to actually have a high school that has an animation program, and oh, I actually, wow. yeah, uh, it was basically beginners animation, and we were just pretty much using simple slides. Uh huh. Um, oh, so you the, were, were, I, you, were you going like the old school? Um, hand drawn method, or were you? Yeah, using... everything was old school hand drawn. Um, one, wow. uh, one of our, one of our finals was to actually make a five minute um, animation, and it oh, and wow. it didn't need to, it didn't need to be good. Uh-huh. It, it just as long as it um, was um, as long, shown as long that as you... you understand the materials, basically okay. the the motions, the uh-huh. the roundness, um, a lot of the edges on the character shouldn't be um, too too um hard on the edges Uh and i remember my senior not senior uh, my uh, sophomore final project was uh, yeah a spoof of beavis and butthead it was (laughs) it was terrible it wasn't my design it was i was stuck with a group of kids who were big fans of beavis and butthead during that time because i'm assuming it was the 90s at this point oh yes and i'm showing (laughs) my age right there (laughs) Yeah, so you know, I say late eight, uh, late nineties, and uh-huh. you know, everybody was really into the Beavis and Butthead mm-hmm. shows, mm-hmm. and uh, of course, yeah, like totally, but, <laughs> fire, <definitely>. fire. <laughs> Don't reason what's so un, um, underrated is during the uh-huh. time everybody was watching Beavis and Butthead, I was uh-huh. really more into Doria or oh, Daria, I, yeah, yeah, Daria, yeah, Daria. Um, even though she was was she was a spin off of Beavis and Butthead, yeah, yeah. What, I did not know that. I never knew that until oh, really? uh, years later. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was her own show. Because <laughs> you can't imagine someone like Daria ever being associated with the likes of Beavis and Butthead. Oh, I still can't. That, that's the weird <laughs> thing. Like you see her in those old show episodes. It's like, ah, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much me. Um uh, me when I went to um, school and I pretty much took a lot of the um, simple, basic, basic art classes. Uh huh. And that's pretty much where I've also learned how to color. And as everybody can see, I enjoy using bright colors. Oh yeah, uh, I, that was one of the the most uh, visually the most one of the biggest visual things that struck out to me stuck out to me when I first saw your art way back when. In fact, I think I first came across your art in when I was in college. And it was probably 2013, 2012, I think. No, no. It was probably around 2013 or 2014 <clears throat> when I came across your your depiction of all of Godzilla's uh, uh, char- all of Godzilla's foes that we knew that at that point within the legendary pictures uh, uh, continuity, where you had the monster from the Comic Con teaser the Shinomura, the female and male Muto, and actually saw the uh, the chibi version of all five of those characters, and I actually had that as my desk as my uh, desktop back background th- throughout all of college. Oh wow! Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. And now I have a, a particular commission that I recently uh, asked you to make. And now as my new uh, as my new desktop backdrop for my new laptop today as yeah as you could tell i enjoy making wallpaper size or wallpaper size um pictures <laughs> right and god bless you for it <laughs> <laughs> thanks yeah and uh but yeah the, one of the thing, the biggest things like if i were to ever describe your art i would say that for me personally uh upon looking at all your work it has a very like stained glass window art feel to it 
You know, you're not the first one who said that to me. Um, really? I, yeah, I did one with um, the the Gamera characters, and I yeah. did I did a few of these weird um, off name kaiju um, large pictures, and a lot a majority of the people said the same things. Like it feels more like uh, whatever you said with the glass thing. Oh yeah, stain, stained glass. Stained glass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's like there's really bright colors. Um, there's a there's a particular like glowy effect to them, and there but at the same time there's also like really hard, um, thick black lines dividing each segment of the uh, character models. The weird thing about that whole um, thick lines for uh, my art is mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that came from. I I get the feeling I got it from somewhere, but I mm -hmm. don't recall where I learned that technique from. Mm -hmm. Because it's like um, looking at your art, especially like looking back to your uh, Gamera 20th anniversary or even to the not the chibi version, but the full size versions of the legendary Godzilla characters. It immediately uh, reminds me of this uh, image that I'm just sharing with you that the audience cannot see. Oh, where it's like panels and thick lines. You know, I'm starting to see that. I say that's probably how I felt when I did that one. Um drawing with Raquel and uh, that Archaeotrix. Okay, yeah. So, uh, what do you think have been some of your biggest um, influences when it came to creating your own unique style? Strangely enough, um, while I do incorporate a lazy style anime drawing, mm -hmm. um, majority of my coloring, um, I have to say, would be thanks to the 90s cartoons. Um, I grew up with, um, let's just say, uh, I'll use American cartoons since um, mm. I remember, I could still remember a lot of the bright ones is um, X-Men, the animated series, or uh -huh. a lot of people know as uh, X-Men 92. Uh -huh. um, I love Batman, the animated series, but I, mm. I never really borrowed, took anything from that in terms of art. Uh -huh. um, the Superman one. Um, I watched a few, and um, mm -hmm. I do enjoy how bright it is compared to how dark Batman's coloring is. Yeah. I mean, again, I love Batman. I don't hate him. But at right. the same time, in terms of drawing, I he's is the colorings are just too dark for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wa the the yeah a lot of the Marvel shows back in the nineties were pretty bright. Yeah, yeah. And there was a lot of, like, hard edge details into a lot of those character models. Yeah. But, or designs. But the one one that actually um, stood out to me, surprisingly, is uh -huh. the HBO Todd Farland Spawn. Yeah, yeah. I do remember. Uh, unfortunately, I did not grow up with that <laughs> for obvious reasons, because unfortunately, I was much younger at the time. Uh, I did come across it uh, during college, I want to say. And um, yeah, I was a big fan of its of its uh, design of its uh, design. It was pretty much like a a less cartoony, more uh, how would I say it? Less stylized, but still very visually pleasing series. Even with its limited animation for like the first two seasons. Yeah, what stood out for me in terms of um, art, mm -hmm. especially with coloring, was mm -hmm. how it. It was a very dark series, I and mean, I'm not talking about the theme or the show. I'm just talking about in colors. Okay. There was a lot of dark colors, mm -hmm. but I liked it how the the red on his cape was very noticeable. It was bright. Ah, it, yes, yes. It wasn't as dark as um, red should be in that kind of setting, but right. it was so bright to the point where when your eyes look at Spawn, especially mm -hmm. in that show, you could literally see the red automatically. Like, it, it sticks yeah. out so well. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where I've learned to, um, usually when I'm stuck doing uh, dark colors, uh -huh. I always use red because in my eyes, red sticks out the most. Especially the, um, since you brought up the legendary Godzilla picture. Uh -huh. Yeah, you could tell yeah, it's like I red is there. So, in a sense, it helps the, the, the viewer's um, mm -hmm. vision on how, how um, I don't know how to explain it. Pretty much how I would prefer them to see it, because the red is what stands out, especially with dark colors. Right, right, and red is a very nice color to complement with darker like colors, like black. Yeah, or we can take your um, Draco Azul, uh -huh. if, and or 
Or I'll say what you and my roommate Albert said. Uh-huh. When I gave you that one picture with him without the scarf, you're like, <laughs> uh, no. He looks so weird without the scarf. <laughs> and it's it's that red scarf that make that helps him, you know, that helps the eye, like the viewer's eye. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, it's in like a nice little balance because without the scarf, I noticed that he, there's too much blue in that design. So the red <laughs> kind of helps balances out all that blue. <laughs> You're like, my eyes, I can't unsee. <laughs> yeah, even when I shared earlier, like recently on the official Drake Lazul, Primal Warrior Drake Lazul page that I recently made for uh, on Facebook, for anyone who wants to follow the progress on the actual Drake Lazul comic that I'm working on, um, I actually shared depictions of like very, like the very first couple of depictions of Draco Azul and some of my uh, friends and slash fans looked at it and it's like, wow, it's so weird seeing him without a scarf back then. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily he has never appeared without a scarf and uh, officially on my channel. That's always been like private uh, earlier prototype designs. <laughs> You're like, I, I don't want anybody to remember that and have it burn <laughs> into their memories. But I, no, actually, I do want people to see it because I just want, I feel like it is a nice way of showing people just how far a single idea can take you. Where it's like you can start out with a really crappy MS Paint drawing with no art skills and still hold on to that idea for dear life because eventually, with enough dedication, time, and patience, and uh, connections, you, are, you will be able to do something with those ideas later down the line. So it's like, it's like almost like you started from the bottom and now look where you are. <laughs> yeah, or or pretty much as a memory sake of how far you've come. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Which, uh, speaking of which, um, looking back at all of your artwork, uh, how would you say you have developed as an artist over the years? And is there anything that you look back on with fondness or the or a lack thereof? <laughs> Oh my god, I'm not sure if I'm like a good artist, but since art is primarily just a hobby for me, uh-huh. I do say that I'm trying to improve um, slowly. Mm-hmm. Not as fast as I want it to, but at the same time, with the lack of time that I have, of course, it's I won't have enough time to um, pretty much focus solely on art. Mm-hmm. But I would say I've come a long way, and I'm, I mean... Honestly, I'm the type that would look back to my old drawings and be like, oh my god, I don't want to see that. Delete, <laughs> delete, delete. I kind of feel the same way with some of my very first reviews on YouTube. <laughs> oh, but, no, because um, yeah. if, if, like, example would be, um, since everybody's um, seeing the on the pic, the current picture on the screen right now, and yeah. that's the, what I have is the Raptor gear. If anybody wants to know, Raptor gear never looked at that cool yes i'm calling my own creation cool he was pretty much a a typical gun um fan fiction gundam knockoff Uh uh-huh and he he had less edges had more of a gundam face Mm -hmm. and smaller shoulders pretty much if you look at him you'll pretty much say he looks like a gundam yeah i went through a huge phase back when um i forgot when um probably during one of my college year where i basically said i didn't want a gundam i wanted something that could look original but still keeps that traditional j- design that that mimics the uh more modern japanese mech design uh-huh and i hate to say it, but gundams is pretty much the best example of modern or japanese uh modern japanese mech design especially for the real robot types mm-hmm. um oh, yeah. love gundam can't get enough of it exactly um so what i did was i pretty much um redesigned the head mm-hmm. and change the head and in that into something that's more sharper mm-hmm. um in a sense if i were to to easily describe it looks more like a beetle's head than it does with what i originally wanted of course which is based off the the raptors uh Mm -hmm. dinosaur uh, the dinosaur raptors Mm -hmm. while still keeping the name um i pretty much um change its look if if i ever show show you in the future of how he looks full body Uh you'll still see the small 
details that is similar to a Gundam, but you uh-huh. would pretty much say it wouldn't be a Gundam. Uh, uh-huh. A best example I could give you is, um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of the viewers won't, uh, or listeners won't know, is um, you can't look at a Hukbine and pretty much call it a Gundam. Everybody oh, would call Huk- it a Gundam, right. but it's not a Gundam. <laughs> right. I was actually going to bring that up because you mentioned about <clears throat> taking like a Gundam-inspired design and making something new with it. And that's something that I kind of like when looking at some of the robots um, in fiction that are meant to be homages to Gundam, but kind of take the design and go off in their own directions. Like the Hukbine from which is a original mech from the Super Robot War series. Another one that comes to mind is uh, the R1. Oh, definitely. Um, the R1 mm-hmm. or any any of the R series actually. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, yeah, R1, R2, R3, R gun, I think. Um R gun and R1, yeah. Yeah, and there's another one that is uh, the Dixon from um Tech Romancer. Oh yes, well he's he's a straight homage to um, the Gundam series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. His his finisher was the the final shot. Oh, nice! He shoots up in the air. <laughs> yeah, he he even bends his head back so ah, much that nice. he does it. You don't see the head. Ah, oh, I see what they did there. <laughs> oh, I really That's need to get Mori that game, for you, man. <laughs> he knows his max. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, that's very cool. And actually, I did have a friend of mine who also had this idea for a fan-made Gundam series that would have involved uh, time travel. And But then he decided to go off in his own direction and said, like, I want to make this more of my own thing. So he made it in, in not a Gundam series, but he started taking it into his own giant robot, time-traveling giant robot narrative. And... See, that's exactly – that That right there is exactly what I went through. I went through that same phase. My mm-hmm. original story called Anisium mm-hmm. um, started off as a Gundam uh, – a shitty Gundam fan fiction. Uh-huh. Then eventually it started becoming its own to the point where I rewrote it, and then now it's pretty much my own uh, my own personal story. Yeah. I just and, hear- um Sorry, I just shared an, oh. an image of the robot from Instagram, along with uh, the audience can't see it, as long as as well as my own reinterpretation of that using Gundam Breaker Three. <laughs> oh my God, he reminds me of God Mazinger. Oh, nice. Oh yeah, he does look a bit. The armor does look a bit like that. He was going for more like because he was inspired. He loved. He was a huge fan of Gundam Wing, and he loved its like European approach to the art style of that show. He mm-hmm. wanted to do that whole, especially with like the half cape thing. Nice. Yeah, because uh, that was the first uh-huh. thing that struck me. Is mainly the head. It's like that reminds me of God Mazinger. Yeah, yeah, it does really. And yeah, which he is went, one of the sadly, ironically, is one of the weakest Mazingers in Go Nagai's world. <laughs> I guess it makes sense because he's essentially like Daimajin, Daimajin, right? So just like a yes, he's just a stone giant. <laughs> he's not like a a technical, a super high powered technical dude. Um, but, uh, yeah, I do love that when fans, they t- instead of tr- making fan fiction, I mean, this is something that, like, Denny and I have talked about off recording many times, where it's like, instead of, like, dedicating solely to making fan fiction, I mean, for me personally, there's there's nothing wrong with fan fiction, there's nothing wrong with fan art, but it's like, if you're able to take something that you love and use that love and inspiration as an inspiration to make something original, something that you can call your own, I feel like that's a much more, like, a rewarding experience for the creator. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's also hard because a lot of, um, Let's just say in terms of a lot of interest is more of if it's a fan fiction, you get more interest because exactly. a lot of people will jump onto it. So a lot of people are really afraid, especially in the artist community. I mean, oh, I'm, yeah. I, I'm not 100 um, percent focused on art myself, but I do mm-hmm. join a lot of art communities. And one of the things I like to do is go and build connections. Um, I go to um, a lot of cons. Let's just mm-hmm. – um, I I I was a staffer at Anime Expo for almost four or five years, uh-huh. and one of the things I like to do is I go to the artist alley and I basically build um, uh, communications um, network and hope to uh, eventually one day um, use that kind of co- connection to help um, commission a lot of arts in the future. Um, even though I'm an artist myself, I mm-hmm. don't really consider my art as professional. Uh huh. While a lot of people may ask for commissions, uh-huh. um, I don't mind doing commission works. But but as you could tell from uh, the past or if, if you ever seen any of my commission um, mm. numbers, 
I usually charge very small because uh-huh. I don't really consider myself as a real artist. I want I rather have real artists real artists out there earn mm. the, the the actual real money that they deserve because I feel like they're what they produce is much better than what I could produce. And I again, see. I'm fucking lazy and I love it. <laughs> I'm just that lazy guys. I'm just sorry. <laughs> I see. So um <clears throat> When you mentioned before about commissions, so out of curiosity, what have been some of your favorite commissions um, in the past? Surprisingly, I've had a lot of good commissions from uh, kaiju fans. Um, Mm -hmm. When I started posting stuff on uh, DeviantArt, primarily, I've noticed that uh, what stuck more to a lot of viewers are all the kaiju stuff and Mm -hmm. there has been a few i probably have done at least seven total of of uh kaiju um commission when i was still active on deviantart Mm -hmm. and those were primarily around the time um 2012 to 2014 right after or right before um legendary godzilla Mm mm-hmm I did get more requests um, later on the line, but they were more requests and wasn't really commissioned. Mm-hmm. And so I did continue doing some requests until um, I got burned out. Burned out. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it wasn't as bad as I thought because um, all those random arts that I've done mm-hmm. actually helped me improve and and um, helped me um, solidify a little bit of my um, current designs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, though prim- that's primarily for monsters, though, because okay. um, I took a break from uh, drawing humans and mechs. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. So, what would you say has been? Uh, have you ever received like a very strange commission in the past? It's like, what would you say has been some of your like str- strangest or oddest commissions? <laughs> this isn't for the young kids, but I have <laughs> received. Um, erotic commissions uh-huh. um, requests mm-hmm. and I've never taken any of them because quite frankly my my art style is more childish I like to call it uh-huh. so I usually never I usually avoid all of those commissions but uh-huh. I've had gotten strange ones and I'd say that the erotic ones are usually the most strangest one I've had because mm. quite honestly they came to me very unprofessionally so really? I'll, I'll just leave it like that <laughs> <laughs> They're like they they come bursting through your door. Hey, I want you to draw this thing I had in mind. <laughs> I, uh, I I I won't say much about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you mentioned before that a lot of your work tends to be more giant monster related, and that you have been been drawing like people or robots recently. Um, is there anything that you would like to? I know you you mentioned you've talked um about me. Uh, you've talked you've shared this with me. Um, off recording that you want to get back into drawing because you've taken a break for a while. Um, do you, would you like to get right back into doing monsters again, or is there something else in mo- that you have in mind about drawing? I wouldn't mind going back into monsters. Um, I've I would say that um, my uh, a lot a lot of my background and a lot of my interests do come from monsters, so that's mm-hmm. not off the chart. But at the same time, usually. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of like slow on my kaiju um, interest right now. Let's just say, I guess there's since there's um, mm-hmm. since after uh, 2014, my uh, interest in um, the kaiju has slowly kind of I wouldn't say fade away, but mm-hmm. has started to become smaller and smaller. I mean, there was a giant burst of uh, kaiju interest for me back in. Um, before 2014 because uh-huh. a lot of the kaiju stuff was rare no one talked about it yeah yeah so you just ate up anything you can get your hands on yeah but now it's like as an adult uh you know and things uh and then i actually have a job that where i could afford these things mm-hmm. i realized that you know once you have a lot of the things that makes you happy you kind of don't want don't want too much and you just kind of want to stand put and mm-hmm take things slowly right you don't want to overindulge in it yeah like for example right now i'm going through a phase where i let's take figurines for example okay before you go back to art let's go to figurines for example yeah i am absolutely tired of collecting godzilla figures (laughs) okay no no 
to correct that, I'm not trying to say Godzilla fi- uh, Godzilla series as a as a whole. I'm just talking about Godzilla himself. Okay. Because yeah. every year there's always a giant new uh, a different version of Godzilla being produced or re released, and quite honestly, I'm just kind of tired of that. Yeah. Like, um, the anime Godzilla. He, uh, I know his figure arts uh, came out um recently. a few weeks ago. Was it? I think so. Maybe. Yeah. I have no interest in it because, quite honestly, I'm just getting tired of Godzilla's. Uh-huh. The only thing that actually brought back that spark is the 2001 Monster Art Godzilla. No, yeah. 2002. No, 2002. That's the one with Kiryu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2002, 2003. That's Kiryu. Yes. I actually love that design. And um, Oh, yeah. That's my like favorite design overall. Same here. I love, awesome. I love yeah. his neck. I love his neck, and I love those. Um, what are those frills? Frills? Oh, Whatever. Yeah, the little, little, like, yeah, large spines on the sides of his neck. Yeah, uh, that neck is. Yeah. yeah, it's like to me, it's like that's a that's a good representation of something that belongs in a show and something that's more modern. I love the balance of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's like you take the already impressive two thousand design and you give it like the classic um, color scheme, and you kind of make it more upright. Yeah, and, and quite honestly, I have no problem with his long neck. I love uh-huh. that long neck. It, it makes him look more realistic, more reptilious, almost like reptilian, but at the same time, not. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can see that. Uh-huh. Yeah. See, uh, of all the, I mean, that's kind of how I feel with uh, giant monsters now. It's like there's just so many that's out there right now, and um, fan creations. Um, official creations that mm. it's just so much that i'm just too lazy to catch up on them yeah yeah okay uh is there any in particular that you want to see eventually down the line to, for me to draw uh let's see just to watch or to experience or to draw anyone anyway either one i do want to i'm waiting for the reveals of the legendary um uh, Ghidorah, Rodan, and Mothra. Ghidorah, Rodan, and Mothra. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm then. really, I'm really excited about that because I every the more I hear about King, the King Ghidorah concept, mm-hmm. the more I'm enjoying the fact that that uh, there's a rumor out there that he might carry that uh, Wyvern look, and I want to see that. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm right. a big, I'm a big fan of um, a lot of fan arts that depict King Ghidorah as a uh, uh, that Wyvern. European Wyvern. Yeah. Well, and, the, the wings are essentially the arms. Exactly. And to me, it's like that is such a very beautiful design for modern King and Dora. And they should uh-huh. uh, totally should really take notes of that, really. Yeah, but of course, knowing the fans, they're probably going to bitch about it to high heavens. I mean, look at what they're already doing now with, with Plantzilla and its jumbo sizeness. You already tell what my first reaction of the new Godzilla was? What was it? Oh, wait, I drew it. Uh, there's that SD picture I drew of God, uh, uh, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> old man Godzilla. Get I off my lawn, you damn, yeah. my planet, you damn whippersnapper. I just imagine him as Clint Eastwood. And yeah. He was telling people to get off his lawn. Get off my fucking lawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that. <laughs> I can totally imagine. Oh, my God. I mean, quite honestly, I can even tell you my first reaction of Shin Godzilla when I first saw that, um, you know, that head. That head picture yeah, was yeah, the first yeah. build of his design. Yeah. My honest opinion of that design was he looks like he's a he's one of those bros that, you know, it's always there, is rather annoying, but <laughs> when you need help, he'll always be there for you. It's like I almost wish he could throw us a thumbs up because he looks like he's smiling. <laughs> that was my first reaction. It wasn't as bad as everybody where you have the, oh my God, it's a nice design or, oh my God, it's a garbage design. No, I was more of like the, oh wow, he looks like he could be one of those dudes that's like, <laughs> hey bro, need help moving? If not, I'm just going to grab a beer. I ain't pretty looking, but I'll always be there for ya. Pretty much. That's kind of, that That was my first reaction when I saw saw that that first um, headshot with that expression that that Shin Godzilla had. Yeah. <laughs> but no, um, drawing wise, I I want to um, take a few mm-hmm. drawings on um, the newer kaiju's that's going to come out. Uh-huh. Um, I don't really know if I want to tackle any of the newer Pacific Rim um, kaiju's. Yeah. I've drew some in the past lazily, but I've, I I have right, had right. You did that one past. Pacific Rim piece. 
Yes, with, 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 uh, with Red Coyote Tango. Hey, hey, I have an excuse for that. <laughs> when they first revealed um, Ki- the Coyote Tango's um, um, first picture, that, the, he was the, shooting that, from his cannon, and yeah. those red, like that, that red spark oh, from the yeah, yeah. was yeah. reflected from the armor, and I thought that armor was red the whole time. For a minute there, I thought that you were looking, you were merely looking at the. Um, schem- like those overly images, like those like blueprint schematics for each of the Jaegers. No, it was uh, the 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 picture reveals, and it had okay. um, Coyote Tango kind of shooting, and then there was the, he, I guess the the silver on his chest was reflecting by those red explosions. Okay. And when I saw saw that, I honestly thought he was red, so I colored him red. <laughs> or maybe that was an inner Gundam fan in you who was making comparison to the gun cannon. Oh, you have no idea. My, that was my first thought, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's a gun cannon with the head of a gym. <laughs> yeah, a more muscular gun cannon. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've been working out the gym all day. <laughs> Get ready to kick some kaiju ass. Yeah. For a minute there, I thought you were gonna go awful on Randy Savage. <laughs> <laughs> Tango is ready. <laughs> and from that, you could tell I was one of those 90s kids who watched WWF. Ah, nice. <laughs> now, oh, formerly WWF. Formerly, yeah, uh, the good old days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but other kaijus that I do mm-hmm. want to draw well, isn't aren't that aren't really kaijus is I want to draw a uh, good group pictures of all of the mechs from Toho movies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be really of course, cool. I'm talking about the big ones. So as much as I love Gunhead, I uh-huh. won't draw him in that picture. Okay, maybe uh, would it be cool if you did like a, a redesign of Gunhead and give him some actual legs, since he he seems to badly want them. <laughs> honestly, I'm actually fine with his tank leg. I honestly <laughs> thought that was one of the best cyberpunk movie that came out of Japan hmm. live too. I have, personally, I have some issues with Gunhead. And for me, like, the half-legs, half-tank thing, it never really suited well with me. It's like, either you have legs or you have tank treads, like, gun tank. Either pick one or the other. You can't have both. I don't know. To me, it always looked weird. How do you feel about the, the, the um, All Right uh, Mechagodzilla? All right. Oh, oh, the uh, original, the uh, the prototype version, the combiner type. Yeah, that yeah. one looks really cool because he actually has legs. Damn it! <laughs> Even though there's still wheels on it, there's still wheels, but they still function like legs. Okay. <laughs> you see, Optimus Prime has wheels also. Don't forget that, but they work like legs. That's true. I was. I kept thinking more of like the Generation One Optimus Prime. Yes, kids. I'm one of those old man. That only remembers Generation 1. Are you one of those truck, not monkey type of peep fans? Oh, no. I love <laughs> Beast Wars. Beast Wars was like one of my favorite child shows. I mean, mm. god damn it. I love Dinobot. I mean, he was like my favorite character in there. Raptor bias, I know. Don't, don't shoot me. <laughs> but yes, it's like Dinobot was one of my favorites. And I did like the concept of um, him being a Predacon, then becoming a Maximo. Because when uh-huh. those action before the the TV show appeared, it was the the toy line. Uh-huh. And I've always thought Optimus Primal being a bat and Megatron being an alligator was dumb. Uh-huh. Okay, it is kind of seems a bit random. Yeah, and then in and out of out of the the toy com- the very first toy commercial I remember, and they introduced it. The Dinobot, and he was a, a Velociraptor, or mm-hmm. Velociraptor, how we viewed it back then. Yeah. And when I saw that, I just fell in love with him because I was in this giant raptor love craze. Mm. Would you say the raptor is your favorite dinosaur ever, considering your your, your moniker of raptor gear? Uh, originally, yes. Um, right now, I'm more of an Archaeotrix guy, which uh, is which, which I Giga still... Raptor. Yeah, and I still consider it to be a part of the raptor family, even though it's uh, scientifically it's not a raptor; it's just a bird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, most of my um, newer um, newer designs or any of the newer, if I do any of original creation, is usually based off of. Um, a lot of people shouldn't see um, like a little chibi raptor that I've always drawn. Right along that with the, pre- the, the chibi shark, right? 
Yeah, and that shark is pretty much uh, supposed to be like a representative of um, a representation of me and my roommate Albert, and we're pretty much just like punching bags of our little jokes because um, they're actually um, in our little um, art circle. The mm-hmm. the joke is they're little familiars that follows um, our character Gaia, but she doesn't mm-hmm. know that they're um, her familiars. She just treats them like pets. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and then they 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 act more like like um, middle aged men's compared to um, actual um, cute critters. So in a sense, um, just imagine them them being cute, but when they speak, they talk like middle aged tough men. <laughs> that that's pretty much my goal with those two those two um, critters, Characters, or I like yeah. to call them the two idiots. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that selling as you could totally sell that as like a pilot. Unlike yeah. Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon. Yeah, so primarily I like using them as kind of like they're the, the, the dumb joke of the show or my stories. Right, right. Okay, then. Uh, let's see. And so, speaking of characters, so we've talked about Gaia and Winter, um, the the two char- the rap the the Archaeopteryx and the shark. By the way, do those two have names? Um, or is it just like the bird and the shark? Um, the shark is uh, his name is Rec, short for Requiem. Okay. Yeah, since um, Albert, he's he's a uh, he's um, on his off time in his hobby. He's more of a musician or right. Com- um, not more of a co- composer, but more of a sound engineer. Okay. And like, um, a, like remixing remixing tracks. I, no, not remixing. He was uh, when we were living in. Um, the Bay Area, especially in uh, Palo Alto, he mm-hmm. worked it with a studio where pretty much he did a lot of recording for all of these um, indie uh, music music um, musicians. Yeah, and so what they do is since they release, um, they will record it, remaster them, and pretty much release them on album. Uh-huh. And uh, he's gotten a few credits for at least a three or four years credit and actually have a lot of albums that he um, himself um, helped master. Okay, then. Yeah, but um, so pretty much when he named the shark uh, Rick Ram and Rick for short is pretty much based off mu- music. So that's that that's what he told me and that's what I'm going with. Okay, and as for the, uh, the Archaeopteryx character? His name is RG. It's A R G G Y. If you really think about okay. it, even harder. RG Raptor Gear. Yeah, that's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. And so let's see. Are there any other characters that you have become you have become very attached to, or some of your were some characters you have developed over the years, like that are of your own creation? I think a lot of people will want to ask about Raquel. She was mm-hmm. originally the created as the original pilot for the Giga Raptor. A lot okay. of you with CKC people will remember that. Yeah. Um, I originally created her as a throwaway character for the Giga Raptor. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, um, it she wasn't really fully my creation. She was really Albert's creation. So uh-huh. uh, Albert had this concept of this uh, female pilot and he mm-hmm. even named her. And... Um, I totally don't remember her last name, but it it it's pretty much uh, means red, which is the reason why her character has red hair. Yeah. Or why a lot of and um. I didn't really care for that character in mm-hmm. all honesty until I the more I drew her, the more I eventually fell in love with her. Mm-hmm. That I wanted to keep her on board, which when it came to a certain time of. Um, kaiju combat character revealed Mm -hmm. she was nowhere mentioned or she was nowhere named because i decided to pull her out of kaiju combat or anything that's related to the giga raptor right and have her be her own character and incorporate Mm -hmm. her into into my winter and no no into my winter and gaia world okay yeah so she in a sense she's just a supporting character in that world but she's there as kind of a uh a human interest for um, Ando, which is pretty much the, the 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 main male character that Gaia and Winter lives under. He's pretty much like their father, uh, or he's pretty much the father of the whole group. Okay, I see. Then yeah, 
And if you're wondering why his name is Ando, is pretty much there's a it goes back with me with uh, name puns. Winter mm-hmm. and Gaia. If you think about it, Winter Ando. Guy, ah, <laughs> uh, you clever, clever guy, you. Um. Yeah. So yeah, if, if if anybody realizes when I do a lot of things, I like doing a lot of dumb jokes that yeah. are small puns. Yeah, yeah. Okay then. And since you mentioned Giga Raptor, um, would it be fair to assume that Giga Raptor might be your most popular creation? I would say so. Yes. Um. Oddly enough, I didn't. When I created the concept of Giga Raptor, I didn't really put too much effort into it. Uh-huh. I just pretty much said, "I want a, I want a arch- Archaeopteryx," so I drew one, and then I said, "I want it to be a, a, a machine." And then I turn it into a machine. Though uh-huh. my biggest mistake is giving it that long neck because now it looks like a dragon. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. But screw it. That that neck looked awesome. Yes, on it, it did. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like fuck it. <laughs> And if anybody have realized it by now, that yeah. the main color scheme for the Giga Raptor is pretty much based off of the Raptor gear. Oh, so Raptor there's a lot of times first. when a lot of people get conf- yeah a lot of yeah Raptor gear actually came first. The uh-huh. the concept of Raptor gear started back in 2002 actually. Oh wow! Okay. And, but back then it w- it was a Gundam. Right, right. Before then you turned it into your own thing. Yeah, and when it became it, my its own thing, um, one of the color scheme that I enjoyed was um, mm-hmm. green, white, gold, red, and blue. Uh huh. And I mainly stick with those colors, which is the reason why, when I created the gig, uh, the Giga Raptor, uh-huh. I made sure that the Giga Raptor has the same colors as the Raptor gear. Okay, okay. So it's like Raptor gear was pretty much like inspired by. No, no, Giga Raptor was inspired by, um, uh, by Raptor gear. Yeah, yeah, uh, but my yeah, uh-huh. even uh, even down to the the gold um, fangs or the gold um, the gold um, sharp claws. It's uh-huh. it's pretty much the same. If if I were to show you a uh, a full scale picture of the Raptor gear and you compare that to the Giga Raptor, you'll see the sim- similarity. Okay, then. So it's kind of like you were kind of translating your older character into a more monstrous form. That's correct. Okay, then. And so uh, what has been, like, the overall uh, reception to your to Raptor, to Giga Raptor? Surprisingly, very positive. I I don't recall much neg- negative um, response with the Giga Raptor. Mm-hmm. Um, the... The only critique I remember hearing is more of it looks too Gundamish, which is pretty much fine with me. I actually yeah. like it that it's right. more of I'm pretty much aiming towards the correct um, design. Though I have I did have a few, um, I forgot who it was. It was a it was a, a very close friend. Um, I forgot his name already. Um, he was one of the the staffers that I was with. At, that worked with me at Anime Expo, but uh-huh. I haven't had a contact with him for a long time. I remember he pretty much said, you know, if you take away that dragon head and put a robot head on it, it still looks like a Gundam. And I'm pretty much uh-huh. like, honestly, I don't mind that quite on. Uh, I mm-hmm. actually don't mind that. <laughs> you could make it like into a transformational gimmick where he has like dragon mode and, and or arc bird mode and wrapped in robot mode. <laughs> Actually, um, remember that picture I gave you with? Um, yeah, you're like retool or redesigning of it. Of it. No, no, the one with the that metal metal wings. Yeah. And it, where the it's like behind the moon. Oh or yes, in front yes of that, the moon. That, right, that one. That's actually an upgrade for it. That that pretty much um, the Giga Raptor could attach with that the plane. That plane that that gives him the saw and that cannon. Or uh-huh. that shotgun. It's pretty much a plane that equips on him. Okay, I was wondering. So pretty much, he will detach his his whole arm, and those the the plane will carry um will attach new arm to it. Okay, okay, I see now. Yeah, yeah. Looking so back he'll lose the feather wings, yeah. but he'll have the, uh, the a chainsaw wings. hand, and yeah. and he had the 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 more plane type wings. Right. Okay. Nice. Nice. Uh, now it would be funny if you actually it, ironic. This would be a total in joke, guys. Uh, if you had attach a drill on the other arm. Oh my god! I <laughs> I thought about that. Trust me, I thought about that. Yeah. Okay. So that's nothing really wrong nice. with having a drill. Yeah. <laughs> nothing wrong. 
unless you're an incompetent uh, game developer who doesn't know how to animate one. Moving on. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Moving onward. So, yeah, I I really like that idea of giving it a more humanoid appearance by giving him swappable parts. Um, I don't know why, but any robot that features, like, swappable parts or swappable weapons and even, like, combining gimmicks has always seemed, like, very cool to me. Me, that's, like, the inner child in me who would love to see that as a toy, given how much of a fan of Power Rangers I, I am. Oh, my God. That, that's... You you since you brought that up, that's uh-huh. pretty much how I designed the Giga, uh, the not the Giga Raptor, the Raptor Gear. Oh my God, I'm falling into that name trap again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> also, I just yeah, real, I just realized yeah. that your wing design looks a lot like your idea for a possible wing set for for Draco Azul back when we were doing that commission. Oh, trust me. There's a lot of times I just want to um, pop the Giga Raptors. Um, wings or design no make him to turn into like a jet pack and attach him to, to any random mech that i see Dude, i even, you, I even did that, that. <laughs> uh, um yeah robot god akamatsu i even had that concept where it's like <laughs> i just take raptor gear um yeah. take off his legs take off take off his his head or just pull it back a little and then and take like, off tur- the tail and and put it onto the back of or replace the red wings of robot god akamatsu and just Paste yes. it on, just like boom. Like yeah, I can, <laughs> and the thing is, every mech I see, I I want to do that. Like you're essentially even, what like what, with what, yours. Yours is a victim too. Yeah. And just, dude, much, dude, I just if you want to play around with, back there. if you want to play around with Draco Zool and have him like combine with 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 rat with Giga Raptor, be my guest, dude. I would love to see that. It's like what, like Gridman when he combines with that red robot um, dinosaur and turns his like armor all around him. Oh, Dino Dragon? Yeah. Oh my God, he, that was like one of the best. Uh, yeah. I swear, Gridman was so good for its time. Oh, you know so what? much advance. <laughs> um, that does remind me of that piece you did. Of it was based off of uh, image of SH Figure Arts Mechagodzilla, but he had a bunch of pieces on him from other um, Toho SH Figure Arts um, figures, and. So he had, like, this Mechagodzilla, but with the head of Mecha King Ghidorah, with, like, pieces of Mogira and the Mazer Cannon all attached to him. And I think you did, like, a fan art of that one, of that depiction. Yeah, it was, uh, I think my my uh, friend, she posted that Twitter to me, and I saw it, and I'm like, I don't know what that is, but I think that looks awesome. So I just yeah. decided to draw it. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> How, how do I how do I get that? <laughs> oh my god, that also gave me a lot of headaches. Let me tell you why. Why? When I saw that Super X one, yeah. yeah, on that figure, I'm like, where the hell is it? How do I get it? I'm willing <laughs> to spend money on that Super X because, quite honestly, I'm always disappointed that um, Super X one was never released as a figure art. Oh Two, yeah. Two, yes. Three, yes. When I saw that one, I'm like. That one is a perfect scale <laughs> for to to put next to the both of the SH figure arts. I want that. I want that now. Uh, that was my reaction when I first saw that toy or yeah, that yeah. picture. <laughs> so let's see. I guess like slowly moving, getting back into Giga Raptor. Um, so you mentioned before that the reception to Giga Raptor has been overall positive, and people have noticed the uh, mecha anime inspirations for it. Um, how I've seen online of other artists' uh, depiction of your character, and so what have been some of your favorites um, when it comes to other people's ver- um, their visions of your character? Oddly enough, um, I enjoyed everybody's depiction on it because uh-huh. I'm. And when it comes to um, an artist point of view, every artist have their own interpretation of it, uh-huh. and while there's only one that I don't like i think i know i think i know what that one is yes yes everybody probably online that knows me probably knows which one i'm talking about but in terms of all these other arts that i've seen of their depiction of um giga raptor yeah very nicely done i love every artist's view on it Uh uh-huh and even some that actually try to work that that complicated design into their own art style is amazing uh-huh. i mean i just love how much um i like to say artists 
I don't know that term. There's a term for it where you pretty much skip a lot of details, but uh-huh. to a viewer's point, it still looks the same. Uh huh. Honestly, I love that because quite honest, uh, I I it's like still, viewing it's still, how, rec- it's still recognizably your it's character. It's still recognizable, but it's also a more cut clean way of doing it without actually going into too much detail into trying to make it a straight copy. Mm-hmm. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like everybody else's interpretation of the wings. Uh, the wings that I've designed is more mm. incorporate towards um, my views of how I enjoy mechs. Uh-huh. But I also like when people come in and try to fix the issues that I have with mech designs and make uh-huh. it their own. Okay. Um, one of the ones that I, I've, I could let me use a good example is, uh, I have a friend from Canada. His name is he goes online by the name Mr. J. Okay. And uh, he did his rendition of the Giga Raptor, and what he did is he uh, he made the um, the wings instead of it being um, some uh, bulky fingers, he mm-hmm. made them to like some thin, almost machete type designs mm-hmm. for the wings mm-hmm. and that turned out really good and i liked that yeah yeah um okay yeah yeah to give it more of that of that bird-like feel right yeah and and my the original idea i have for the giga raptor especially for the wings is i was thinking more it, it will pull out more like a pocket knife where each, okay because i got wings, a bit i got a bit a bit of that uh switchblade vibe from those wings there you go yeah that's pretty much it i i wanted something similar to like a switchblade but at the same time if you want to add in real world physics those things will be way too heavy for its arm but yeah. this is fantasy <laughs> i don't care yeah there's there's anti-gravitational thingamajigs in their wings and uh, something something you can always else. use the, the gundam the gundam excuse it's a space only unit Done. <laughs> ah there we go yeah yeah <laughs> he we he has wings to flap through the void empty void of space because fuck <laughs> you no that's how it air. works <laughs> <laughs> yes he needs wings to fly fly through no air but yeah, it's, I guess when it comes to um, just that that quick character that yeah. I drew as a throwaway, mm. I'm more surprised that fans still remembers um, that creation. In a sense, that's kind of more of something that I do enjoy that people do in do like it. Um, uh-huh. Other than that, then I do enjoy people more interested in a lot of my fan arts. Uh, uh-huh. in, Going away from the original stuff, uh-huh. I do enjoy that a lot of people do appreciate a lot of the Godzilla arts I've done, uh-huh. mainly because from when I was young, I it's I was always scared to draw Godzilla. Uh huh. Reason why is because I had so much respect for that fictional character mm-hmm. that I never want to touch him because as soon as I draw him, I feel like I'm gonna make him look bad. Mm-hmm. Now this is before. Um, the 2000 variation where he looks more dinosaur because even with the the heisei godzillas I, it was hard for me to draw because he had a lot of cat like features in his yeah. face oh yeah totally that's how i always saw that version of him yeah and, and it was complicated because he has those um four bumps on his cheeks and i will oh, always yeah. draw one bump bigger than the other and <laughs> it pisses me off that i can't do that because yeah. i'll automatically draw him to some weird shape dinosaur head Uh uh-huh so i always stayed away from him but then that's when i gravitate towards um my favorite character from toho angiris or angulus Mm -hmm. i don't know how to pronounce or which pronunciation is the correct way so i'm just gonna call him (laughs) angiris you can always that's how i go go about it too or you can always go with the japanese pronunciation and be done with it angulus yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's like, let's see, I'm just going to take a quick look at him and see what the what the katakana reads out. I think, if I can remember right, An- it's Angilas. Yeah, yes, Angirasu, Angiras, Giras. There so you, you just, go. You just got to roll the tongue like like a, <laughs> like a Mexican. <laughs> see, I can't do that. Yes, I actually can't do that. It's weird. I've tried. I can't. Mm. I can barely do it, but I've, I've gotten used to it. Uh, I've gotten slightly used to it. Like, I can't roll the R. I can't do the R. Er, fuck. I can't do the R. Yeah. Er, er, er. Um, yeah, I can't do that. I can't I, do that. I, I can't My do mouth that. Is, uh, I have one of those mouths that's constantly dry, so I can't really do that. 
Yeah, but I can't do that, but I can still do the ra. So I can do ra, I can do la, and I can do ra. <laughs> and that's the funny thing with Japanese R's. People tend to think that Japanese don't know how to pronounce L's. They can. It's the R's they have trouble with because they roll all their R's. They can't. It's impossible for them, almost impossible for them to do the uh, English R sound, you know, rolling the tongue without having it touch the roof of your mouth. Yeah, like when they say um, rock, uh, locks, they say rocks. Yeah, exactly, yeah. They can't say rock man, they say rockman, rockman. Yeah, it's totally understandable. Yes. But so yeah, it's not, um, it's not technically if you want to be a snob about it, it's not angiras, it's not angilas, but it's an angiras. <laughs> I'm just going to call him angiras. That's how I pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um I I grew I actually grew up loving Angiris even yeah. though he didn't really do much in a lot of the movies right yes I mean my my childhood memory was Angiris was this badass monster fighter and then re-watching Godzilla vs. Gigan or any of the movies mm-hmm. now especially at like my age and I'm like he did nothing. He just stood in the background while Godzilla got his got his ass handed to him. M- I don't care. He's still my favorite. Meanwhile, meanwhile, you you see like Willy Wonka. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. Yeah, pretty much. Well, that's funny. But yeah, like... no, I I still love him. And then I as yeah. as uh, you could tell from a lot of my deviant art that I do have a lot of pictures of Angiris. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's really funny because my first uh, introduction to Angiris was my second Godzilla movie, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. And so it's like, it was really weird and random just to see him like pop up out of nowhere. Only to get, and get his, know, ass only get, <laughs> get his ass handed. Get his ass handed because it's like, who is this guy and why should I care? Wh- where did he come from exactly? Oh my god. I never <laughs> saw Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla until I was in high school. Oh wow! So my first my first time seeing Angiris was actually Godzilla versus Gigan. Hmm. I think that was probably one of the uh, maybe the mid tier Godzilla movies I saw because I, rem- I remember catching it online on online on TV um, during one Thanksgiving uh, holiday weekend, and I was sitting there and I was like captivated, and all of my family decided to watch it with me. Um, but I think that was probably one of the first as well, because I remember that image of, like, Godzilla and, and grappling Gigan, they're, like, on the ground, that always, like, stuck in, in my head, along with that image of, like, uh, Gigan, like, roaring while the the fire is lighting his face all red as he's walking through the city. That was a nice scene, I have to admit that. Yeah. Oh, the mat the 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 doll using the dolls as mannequins was very strange upon rewatching it on DVD. I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. If you see the the shot, there's a close up shot of Gigan ramming his foot into a building. Oh, okay. Now I know what you're saying. Yeah, there's like a couple mannequins, but they're clearly like do- like little dolls. <laughs> like, like Barbie dolls, and so as a kid, like when I about in high school, when I saw this, I'm thinking, are those dolls supposed to be actual people or like mannequins in a department store? Because <laughs> because it's at that point, it kind of those seeing those real life dolls kind of ruin the illusion that this is meant to be a model. This this is meant to be something more than a, just a model. <laughs> It's the seventies Godzilla films. They gotta save budget right there. True. It's all about it was all about cutting corners for every movie studio in the seventies. You know what monster that I was never a fan of? Who? But that's only because I saw him that movie very late. What? Is a uh, Hedera. Okay, I can I can see. I that. like drawing Hedera, but in terms of caring for the monster Mm -hmm. i know i get hanged by a lot of godzilla fans on this but i've never really cared for that movie and that's mainly because growing up i've never been able to find the hetero movie until um sci-fi channel started um showing it and that's my first time seeing godzilla versus hedora and by that time i was already in college and when i saw it it did nothing to me i just kind of saw it as okay it's just another godzilla movie and that was it like like i know a lot of people saw it earlier like how a lot of us saw godzilla vs megalon and absolutely fell in love with that Uh even though it was such a cheesy movie yeah no it was like yeah i never got that with hedora because i it was the last showa movie too that Mm. i saw 
Like I could okay. never find it. Yeah. And when I finally found it, watched it, I was kind of underwhelmed. It's like I I just didn't really care mm-hmm. for it. I see. It's like um, Hedorah was also one of the very last um, movies that uh, in the Godzilla series that I ever saw. I probably was in uh, maybe middle school because I saw I rented it from a blockbuster. So this should give you a good idea as to when oh, this wow. was. Like so, mid nineties, maybe. Oh no, no, probably like mid two thousands. So I want to say Blockbuster's still alive then? Yeah, yeah, it was alive when I was in middle school. We're both yeah. from South California, and I don't remember <laughs> that. Yeah, well, maybe my part of South California was better. <laughs> well, damn. <laughs> well, um, anyways, uh, I did not, even though it was one of the last ones, I was always aware of it because I remember seeing, like, trail. I had uh, a couple movie. I had, like, those old Scimitar VHS um VHSs of Godzilla, which would always have like random trailers to other Godzilla movies and monster movies. And I had this VHS. I'm not sure if anyone on Earth knows about this, but there's this VHS called Hollywood Dinosaurs. It was. Oh, I actually have that. Yeah, nice. Um, if dude, if you could get like, if you can somehow get that transferred digitally, that'd be so awesome. <laughs> but uh, I do have it digitally, to be honest. I transferred it from my old VHS tape. Nice. Uh, if you could send it to me, I would. I would be so thankful, man. Uh, no worries, I will. <laughs> nice, awesome. Uh, so I did see the trailer in in that compilation because yeah, Hollywood dinosaurs. It was kind of like a documentary on the history of of dinosaurs in cinema. But in all reality, it was just a compilation of public domain trailers. Yeah, and... it was that 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 whole documentary was just pre- there wasn't even a a, um, a narration. The narration oh, no. was only in the beginning, and then after that, it was nothing but trailers, and that was it. <laughs> well, he would show the the narration would show up maybe at the beginning of every trailer, and he would talk for like maybe twenty seconds, and that's it. And then really, the rest I don't of remember the that. Yeah, yeah, I do remember he would talk extensively about Godzilla up until the point where he's saying, "Oh, and now a new movie's going to come up with featuring Steve um uh Steve Martin or was it or Raymond uh, Burr or uh, Steve Martin as Raymond Burr or was it Raymond Burr as Steve Martin?" So he's kind of doing a little <laughs> joke there <laughs> in his like very dry wit for the narration. Um Speaking of which, I hate to go on this tangent, but there was, you remember there was this one portion of Hollywood Dinosaurs where there was these, uh, there was this couple on a beach being attacked by a stop motion plesiosaur. Oh, Loch Ness? No, 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 not Loch Ness. But uh, it, it was called like Escape from Adventure Island or Lost in Adventure Island. That's what the narrator claimed what the, the clip was from. And he used that uh, plesiosaur attack. Uh, to describe the art of stop motion. And for years, I was always wondering, what the hell is that movie? And until I found out, I guess it was some sort of, of I guess, softcore, low-budget bud- low type of film. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> that explains the poor ADR quality dubbing. <laughs> that almost sounds like that... that uh... That dinosaur one with I'm not sure if it was with Elvis Presley or somebody where it's like some random dude goes into this dinosaur world where it's pretty much like eye candy where it's like girls in bikinis and it's like uh-huh. dinosaur claim the uh, claim stop motion dinosaurs. Uh, oh, I yeah, I remember it. watching that and I'm like, okay, this movie was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for the dinosaurs, goddammit! <laughs> I think maybe the the title of the movie might be Lost on Adventure Island, 1984. It, it might be the same movie? Maybe, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, that was always something I, I always wondered about. And I remember there's the lines where the woman was like, What is that? And the, <laughs> and the, and the, the, the boyfriend goes, It's big and hungry. Oh. Uh, so yeah, like the... Yeah, so I never really cared for in um, Hedera. I mean, right. I actually cared more for Megalon, and that's sad. <laughs> okay, then. But again, I do like I... Megalon as a character. He's such yeah. a a um, awesome character that a lot a lot of people can see a few um, four comas I did with just uh, Angaris. I mean, not Angaris. Um, Megalon, Ga- Megalon and, and Gigan, Gigan. being yeah. buddies. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, I'm surprised that not a lot has been done with Megalon outside of the uh, recent video games. Recent video games? Oh, yeah, you know, the uh, the Pipeworks, Atari, 
uh, video games, uh, save the earth, uh, uh, destroy all monsters, melee, save the earth, and unleashed. And I don't know, Godzilla I don't domination. know, Andreas. That's more than ten years ago. <laughs> that is true. That is that is very true. That so if you want to say that the Android games where they have that weird monster collection Toho Android games, then that's yeah. sadly no longer available on the Japanese Google Store. That is terrible. That game was awesome. Uh, I wish I, I I could play that game. Apparently, is it one of those games where you just like you collect monsters, um, kind of evolve them and battle each other? Right, kind of like uh, kind of yeah. The Super Robot Wars Cross Omega. You collect robots randomly, or you can like pay real money to get certain robots. Yeah, it's the typical like Android type phones or the mobile phones, okay. and uh, I think that might be the system that Daikaiju Daikusen might be going in, the, the one made by uh, Garayan, or Garayan. Oh my god. Where... I'm actually interested in that ever since you told me. Like, I totally, yeah. like I said, I was off the Kaiju chart for, like, the longest time, and when yeah. you told me about that game, <laughs> I'm like, what? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they might be going to a similar system. He might be going to a similar system where it's like he have all these characters, and so there's some sort of, like, a slot machine slash, like, Gashapon, Gash- Gashapon kind of style, capsule style, where you know you you pour put some you activate it to get a random monster, and it could be like a rare monster or a common monster. Um, that might be it. I could be wrong though. But considering uh, how many monsters are going to be in the game, I can imagine this uh, system something like that. I'm just kind of glad that there's somebody out there who still has a passion for creating. Um, fan-made kaiju games yeah, or yeah. then again and the quality of it doesn't even look fan-made it's i like to say that's close to like i like to say it's it's still an indie game but i would yeah. like to say it looks almost like a published um android game yeah it's really amazing that here i don't i think he's like a self-learning game he's an artist by trade but he's a self-learning game developer like he's learning all of this de- game design shit as he's going along and so it's like he's sticking to his best assets, which is like, you know, 2D art. And he's like making this game using these 2D art assets and is even experimenting with like flash animation. In yeah. certain cases. Yeah, and- I think I, there he did post a few on uh, DeviantArt and mm-hmm. I'm not sure if he has his own website, but I remember seeing his um, original um, mm-hmm. Comic, comic that he did or manga. Oh, and Rai I've are, always uh, wanted, yeah, I've always wanted to purchase it. Like, yeah, yeah, me too. I would online. love online. Yeah, I would love to have like a physical copy of that comic because yeah, his artwork looks amazing. I, I, he definitely seems to have like a, a large preference towards the color red, and it. I love his his use of those colors. Like I said earlier, that red just stands out. It's oh yeah, it's totally. not even that's it's not even my favorite color. Like how you have blue, <laughs> yeah. I have. Green, and yeah, you yeah. can easily tell, but red just stands out as a color by itself. Oh yeah, totally, totally. Um, but yeah, uh, it's really great that we have someone here who's actually getting the job done and is actually trying to stick to what he knows best, as opposed to doing something far beyond his imagination, unlike another person. Hint, hint, or, hint. or his cap- capability. Beyond his cap- his capability. Yeah. Whoever that person may be, he or she may be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's see. So, what would you say are some of your, uh, going back to your favorite and least favorite, or your favorite monsters, what are some other monsters, or even in this case, like, monsters and even Mecha, that have been always been some of your fan favorites? Um, or not fan favorites, just... but always been your personal favorites, that's what I meant. Oh, personal favorites? Um, let's just say, there is a monster in Gridman uh-huh. that I actually like. Uh, I'm trying to uh, remember what's his name, but he's he has two swords on his hands and he has one sword on his nose. Uh huh. And I think his name is Briya Briya B A I R A S. Uh huh. I can't remember, but he was one of like the nicest monster I've ever seen of from uh, Gridman, and seeing that costume and. And doing choreograph with the suit actor in Gridman was mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. And again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier with Gridman is I felt like for a Tsuburaya production, uh-huh. it was way ahead of its time. Like the, the transformation sequence, 
the the um the concept itself was amazing and all the monsters that he fought mm-hmm. i loved how the action was so fast paced it's like a lot of the tokusats especially even with um the the 90s ultraman uh-huh. i see it where a lot they're limited by um the how much stunt they could do uh-huh. and a lo- how how a lot of the um stunts are covered up or a lot of the the limitation of stunts that is usually covered up is through um like the finishers or the special beams mm-hmm. and newer sentais and common rider series suffers through that too it's like oh, they rely too much on special effects yeah and and i'm not talking about good special effects i'm talking about like when when let's let's just take example be uh um, last few episodes of Build that I watch is like when he yeah. jumps and and they use the 3D model. Oh, with, with the, that, tell the, the 3D model. Yeah, you mean that those stupid? Or yeah, you mean when he's using that stupid, uh, like mathematical formula shit that he somewhat somehow slides down. Yeah, or or the I even said the the one thing I hate about like any of these the newer Sentai's and yeah. even. Or tokusats in general is yeah. when there is wings on that suit. Like for I use Kamen Rider build the uh-huh. most. The thing that I hate the most is when he gets the um, something Gatlin. It's the bird and oh, the Gatling. Ha- Hawk and Gatling. Hawk, Gatling, yeah. And then that those tiny pra- practical wings on his back just looks terrible when he does stunts. Uh huh. Oh, kind of like flopping about. Yeah, and it, it it's terrible looking. But mm. when you look at like um, Gridman, his yeah. shoulders are kind of flimsy, but they were made to the point where it's like the suit actor could actually do like good stunt, and they don't need to use CG to make up and pretend um, mm. that uh, pretend that that you know the suit actors are doing certain moves. Yeah, like when in in the newest sentais when they start flying and or if they have any ability that could fly yeah. it automatically becomes very bad green screen and when CG they add in the actual uh-huh. tv the tv it it looks terrible like yeah yeah especially like, when low budget terrible yeah that's always been one of my problems because i noticed that especially in the case of a lot of earlier shows like once a lot like toei and superaya switched to digital cameras it feels a lot of the productions feels really cheap. It's yeah. like, that's one of the things that's prevented me from um, getting into Gridman a lot. Like first off, I, it's very difficult for me to even find it online. But um, the second thing is that with Gridman, is that I think that was the first production they ever used digital cameras on. So there's this very high frame rate, almost like this like telenovela esque like uh, style frame rate, where it kind of just looks cheaper. And mm-hmm. not at all as cinematic as like Tiga and Dinah and everything else. Thankfully, afterwards looked had a more cinematic feel to it. Um, I know it's the same thing also with uh, with uh, Sentai and Kamen Riders, where they also have this a bit of a cheaper feel to it, digital feel to it, shot on digital video feel to it. Yeah, um, yeah. So to me, it's like I, I like I did enjoy. Uh, Greed man because uh, one mm-hmm. thing or here's one thing I do like with um, Subaraya's tokusats especially when they're like fold on suit uh-huh. is I like how a lot of the suit actors could do flips oh and, yeah and, yeah um, jumps. I, even, I, even know, I even noticed that with like someone like Gomera could also do flips and tricks and some of the more recent shows Exactly, and let me just post you um, the the monster name that I was I was talking about is Bagheera uh-huh. Uh huh. This is how he looks like. Or that's his upgrade. The, I'm posting on the link. It's pretty much his uh, mecha upgrade. Let's see. If you can see it. Let's see. I don't think it's loaded yet. Oh, I think we're still having that problem where anything I type or anything that that I uh, load in there is you're not going to see. Okay, so in that case, you can just send it to me via email then. Yeah, uh, let's just say, um, yeah, the suit mation or the sh- uh, the sequence, the choreographs yeah. for uh-huh. for Gridman was mm-hmm. so amazing that even mm-hmm. I was surprised that um, a lot of the the suits actors in mon- full on monster costume could yeah. do the stunts that they could do. Uh-huh. Like, sir, there was this one humanoid monster 
that the suit is very bulky, but he was doing like a real traditional uh, Chinese martial arts style, and I thought that was amazing. Mm-hmm. You would think he would um, hit he would hit the suit, or you even kind of question it's like how many shots did it take for that actor to actually pull off that move in that suit? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I got your email. Checking out the link right now. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I've seen this guy before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, he, didn't he make a, an appearance in that uh, Gridman anime short? Um, no, I don't think so. No. Um. Okay, but I definitely remember seeing this guy um, elsewhere. I mean, it was like someone's video review of the series. But yeah, that looks really cool. And I can see where they um, get, left a lot of room open for the thighs to move around for him to do those stunts. Yeah, and and to be honest, I, I since we're going, uh, we can easily go off. It's like, yeah, he's in terms of like characters, but also um, Gridman as the show itself. Uh huh. I didn't watch Gridman. Um, as its as its original form, I uh-huh. actually grew up watching Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad. Yeah, and I fell in love with the the, the English adaptation. Uh huh. So years later, when I had access to um, the um, the Japanese version, uh-huh. I, I have all of it. By the way, oh, the whole series. I have the whole series. Oh, nice. But I have it on DVD. When they announced the Blu-ray, I was cringing my teeth. Yeah, <laughs> it's like. Why you bastards? <laughs> Anyways, back to the back to uh, Superhero and Samurai Cyber Squad. Yeah, and I, I saw I when I watched it, I fell in love with the the Amer- uh, American adaptation. Yeah, and then years later, when I saw the Japanese version, uh-huh. you'd be surprised that there's a it, the the English version is is one of those very close to the the Japanese ver- uh, the Japanese um rich or the original Japanese version. Uh-huh. Like. A lot of the characters were still there. You still have the the main the main villain boy who's pretty much a shut in. Uh-huh. Um, that's that's pretty much teams up with the main villain, and mm-hmm. you still have a group of kids who are tech savvy and pretty much live in the basement and right. pretty, and uh, and you know one forms. I mean, there's a few things I have to admit that the English version is better with um, a lot of the friends actually going inside the cyberspace and piloting those um, the, the vehicles. Because mm-hmm. in the Japanese w- version, um, they were just using video game joysticks and just, you know, playing. It's like they're playing video games. Right, right. <laughs> but in the American version, they actually go in with the main the main hero. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's that. true. And I, I liked it that. And um, like I said, it's like it was one of those like I was amazed. Like I was just kind of shocked, like how well the English adaptation was after seeing the original. Yeah, yeah. OK. I then. mean, but, I could go uh, on with how, uh, like how yeah. Sunrise screwed up Kamen Rider, but that's a different uh, story. <laughs> <laughs> Sunrise, you mean Toei? No, no. How uh, Saban. Sorry, Saban. Oh, okay, okay, okay. When Saban, Saban brought Kamen Rider yeah. over, I Mask thought that Rider. was the worst. Mask Rider. Mask Rider. Yeah, that was the worst adaptation <laughs> I've ever seen. Because the first episode was pretty much, they were using um, footage from Z.O. And I'm like, <laughs> Z.O. and Black RX are like two different characters. And it's like, audience aren't dumb enough to look at the screen and say, that's Z.O. in screen. And then they switched to Black on the screen. Then they went back to Z.O. <laughs> it's like, I mean, like the the stock, you mean the stock footage used? Yes, the stock footage for oh, Black. They, oh, they were Black... using stock footage of. They were using stock footage of Black RX in the TV show. Oh no! Yeah, sorry, it, sorry. Oh, they were oh. using stock footage from the Z Cross movie into the or the ZX movie into the the, the show. Not ZX. <laughs> ZX is the the the, er, the earlier one. Yeah, okay, ZO. Okay, ZO. Right. Okay. So Zio was a more recent movie, and they were using stock footage of Black RX from that movie into the American TV show. Yeah, it was it was weird. Like I literally saw the difference, and and that always threw me off when I was a younger kid. Was like and, the movie because it was newer. The quality of that footage was nicer looking. Yes, and then when they started showing more of. Uh, the the black RX uh, footage you can huh. literally tell the difference because it was, like more, um, it was grainier right yeah and when you like example would be with um Z- ZO yeah Doros like the main villain yeah it that was like one of the best Japanese um, tokusatsu monster suit 
ever because you actually uh-huh. saw the 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 muscle flex you saw the 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 jaw the eyelids everything uh-huh. like it, it was one of the um uh, nicest suit design ever actually all all the suits in that movie was nicely done especially even with the bat uh-huh but uh but when you saw him you know when they use footage of him fighting Doros in the Savant's Mask Rider, it looked it much better than when they started using footage from Black RX because those are TV quality suits. Yeah, yeah. So you can literally tell the difference in that. I lost interest in the uh, English adaptation, and, and I wasn't surprised when it it, it um, was eventually canceled. Yeah, uh, I was. You know what? I try. I never grew up with common with um, Mask Rider, Saban's Mask Rider, but I did saw the uh, crossover with Power Rangers. So I was always wondering who that character was. Even though I found out, oh wow, I actually grew up with some toys from from Mask Rider. <laughs> That's crazy. I actually had like uh, the blue Cyclops guy. I had a figure of his yellow and black uh, robot form, and I had like a small little wind up toy of mask rider on his uh, motorcycle where you those toys where you pull it back and let go and watch it go by uh, but uh, I tried looking back I found it online and I tried watching an episode of Saban's mask rider uh, back in high school and I was, I was like nope <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it was the, the the writings was terrible yeah I couldn't really stand that um, I, you could say the same thing about early Power Rangers, but I still think there's some level of charm there that is absent in um, in Saban's Mask Rider. Because at that point, you would have realized you could have at least hoped that they would have learned from like, because this was like season two or three of Power Rangers, so you would have expected them to actually learn how to get it right, as opposed to getting something that's just as bad, if not worse, than season one of Power Rangers. <laughs> Yeah, but at the same time, I I do appreciate the English adaptation of Power Rangers because, quite yeah. honestly, that was a lot of my childhood right there. <laughs> Absolutely, and there's a lot of nostalgic charm to that show, which is why I can never, you know, hate it or criticize it all that much. I mean, I can criticize it if I look at it critically, but I can never like hate actively hate it. Yeah, same with me. Which I mean, I I fell in love with, um, or it was thanks to Power Ranger that uh. I started getting way too much into Sentai's, uh-huh. and then um, so my start with Sentai's actually goes back to uh, Car Rangers. Uh huh. And no, not Car Ranger, Turbo Rangers, the the original ones. You mean Power Rangers Turbo? No, no, no. Power Ranger Turbo is Car Rangers in yeah. Japan. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about Turbo Rangers, the original one. Oh, you mean Go Ranger? Is it Go Ranger? No, not Go Ranger. That's not not that far back. The, okay. The, the first Sentai teams to focus on vehicles. Okay. Um, that was my first um, introduction to them, but I never really saw them as um, Super Sentai or anything. I was just a kid, so I just sat there and watched. And I, I never saw it all the way through. I just saw, like, certain episodes. Yeah. Then eventually I watched it live, man, which I really liked. Let's see, was it were it these guys? Uh, let's see. Yes, them. Okay. Yeah, they kind of and got then, a bit uh, of a RoboCop looking vibe to them. Yeah, um, and then I eventually watched Live Man, and I watched that thing all throughout, and I thought that was really well done. Yeah, yeah. Then when Power Ranger came, I, uh, my memories of um, um, Zoo Ranger or yeah. Zoo Ranger, I never had it. I didn't even realize that Power Ranger was an adaptation of Zoo Ranger. Oh, really? So okay. I was watching it and I fell in love with it. Yeah, Years yeah. later, when I found out that um, it's, it was an adaptation, it kind of, like everybody else, it forces me to actually look for those um, original episodes. Right. Now, when you saw uh, Turbo Man and uh, Turbo Ranger and Live Man, did you see them on television on like a Japanese channel? No, I actually saw them at a Hong, uh, a Hong Kong swamp meet or a uh, Chinatown swamp meet uh-huh. where they're all dubbed in Chinese. Okay, I'm assuming you had some. Pro- Did you, you or your family had any proficiency in in Chinese? Oh heck no! I just watched it because it was <laughs> badass. Okay. I did not understand anything. All I did was just I was a kid back then, so I was yeah. like, of course, I'm just gonna sit there and watch. Yeah. You know, watch the the guys in the spandex go pew pew pow pow bam pow boom. pow oh no the monster is big summon thy zord or summon yeah. thy mech <laughs> yeah yeah 
Okay, then. And uh, let's see. So, being a big fan of tokusatsu, especially televised tokusatsu, what is your opinion on the current state of tele televised tokusatsu programs? Um, Subraya's Ultraman is doing... In my opinion, the Ultraman franchise is doing much better than they did after Nebius because I know that um, right because there was like a big slump where all we got were like so, an occasional movie or or direct to video special here or there. Yeah, I, I to be honest, um, I felt like um, that slump was mainly because of the all the the legal issues that Subray was going through. Uh huh. Or um, uh, Subray production. Uh, to be uh, specific, um, uh -huh. and um, that's when um, I like to say Toei kind of got the jump start. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm also disappointed because the 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 interest and feedback with Sentai's and Kamen Rider are, has been kind of going downhill. Uh huh. But that's only me. I'm not sure what it is in Japan, but from my understanding, especially mm. from the few. The few friends I have, like uh -huh. their interest, is the decline of storytelling because a lot of the storytellings are, in a sense, they're made for kids, but they're but they're also treating kids as in they're stupid. Uh huh. Like I can sort of see that. Like yeah, it's like there's that notion where it's like they're they're still treating kids dumber than they are i mean these kids aren't stupid the 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 more the more time passes the more kids are more self-aware of how certain things are happening mm -hmm. and then how they're trying to market towards um the biggest issue i have with tokusats now is they're all way too focused on certain Certain aspects that are such like uh, the Happy Meal toys or any of the tiny figurines. Like, oh yeah, it's all about it's one giant. I feel that's I kind of feel the same way. It just feels like one giant toy commercial. That's all it is. Like um, I I'll use um, I kind of stopped after um. In S Super Sentai, I actually stopped after um Gokaiger. Uh -huh. Like I suddenly stopped caring about um like. Go um, Super Sentai for the longest time, and mm. I while I did come back for um, Ko Ko the Kyo dinosaur. Ryuger. <laughs> yeah, sorry, my lips is starting to dry. No problem. Or my throat, technically, but um, <laughs> yeah, the the dinosaur one, I did come back, but that was out of dinosaur bias. So, right. Yeah. But um, anything after that, I just never really got interested in it because um, it just got too kid uh. I think it's probably my uh, as since I'm growing up, I just uh -huh. kind of grown grown out of Super Sentai, uh -huh. and then every time I watch Super Sentai, I just kind of I can't see it how I was when I was younger, uh -huh. and so I decided to just stop watching Super Sentai and just continue watching Kamen Rider. Uh -huh. And then, um, how's, so how's Kamen Rider? How do you feel Kamen Rider is like nowadays? I feel like the change in writing definitely hurts it a lot um i think after i'm not sure if it was after w or during wizard uh -huh. come wizard uh -huh. that a lot of uh toei kind of did like a, a staff shift and uh -huh. they had a lot of the super sentai's writer come into come or come into common writer and started mm -hmm. becoming main writers mm -hmm. and one of the things i've kind of I, I, I believe I've watched one of your podcasts. Mm -hmm. I think it's the Build Bot podcast. And yeah. I agree with um, you and your friend yeah. um, on the fact that there's a lot of Japanese only jokes that kind of it's like a hit and miss, even if you're somebody who's, who's really, um, you know, into Japanese culture, or even uh -huh. like we would look at it and be like, okay, that was just pure dumb. Uh huh. And there's a lot more of that kind of humor showing popping up now, and I feel like that pretty much kind of insults the the viewer, even if if you know we're foreign um, foreign viewers to them. It's it's kind of gotten to the point where it's like I feel like a lot of the things that they do is unnecessary. Like uh -huh. one of the things I hate for Kamen Rider now is the the constant upgrades they get and the more upgrades yeah. they get it's, it gets super bulky to the point where it just looks dumb yeah yeah like a good upgrade that i do like was drives upgrade um 
where it's sleek, it's it's sharp, mm-hmm. nice, no, no bulkiness. I love that. Or like going but, all the way back to Kuga, where his ultimate form is like gold, right? Or no, it was black with gold highlights. No, see, I, I take I, for Kuga all the way to um, the 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 early Heisei's um, Kamen Riders. Yeah, I. I Considered them differently because those uh-huh. stories were actually done well. And right. the one appeal that I have with Kamen Rider was it was always aimed towards a older demographic compared yeah. to Super Sentai, right. which is naturally aimed for a younger demographic. Yeah. But lately, Kamen Rider has be has um, Toei shift with Kamen Rider has has garnered them towards um, the same uh, demographic as Super Sentai. So there's right. this giant conflict that that of interest that um, both the the community that that enjoys mm. both those shows have like co- when like when you watch Kamen Rider Kuga yeah have you seen it uh, not yet but I really really want to because that's the one that everybody on my comment section like recommends to me as someone who hates all the trappings of modern day Kamen Riders yeah uh, the thing is with Kuga let's just say Kuga has a really balanced story. It's about detective. It, there's it follows a detective story, a a nobody who eventually gets the Kuga mm-hmm. um, belt, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was really a really well done detective story. Mm-hmm. Like it was a straight like mystery. And then you then the the one that came after Agito. Yeah, Agito was also more of. A, it also has a weird mystery as well, but it presented itself as really mature uh, theme. Mm-hmm. There's still a few um, slight jokes that uh, that hints towards humor that that's hint towards more like a, a junior high school level kind <laughs> yeah. of audience. Uh-huh. Not compare like how modern day su- sent um, tokusats are aimed towards elementary kids. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So and then uh, then there's. Um, Kamen Rider Ryuki, which to me is the the um, originator of like the newer shows like Madoka, the, the newer animes that that borrows the same concept like Madoka or uh-huh. um, any of their um, shows that based off Ryuki. The while Ryuki introduced the the, the card the card gimmick that a lot of people hate, uh-huh. it was done really well, and the, the the whole backstory and concept was pretty dark. Uh-huh. And that's again that goes back to why I like Kamen Rider. It's more Kamen Rider was darker, edgier, and it's not edgy to the point where it's like you're cool edgy, but edgy to the point where it's like it's supposed to, it comes close to like a science fiction mystery. Uh huh. And like if you watch Kamen Rider Fives, even though like it the story deteriorated towards the last few ending, like uh-huh. all of Fives is really well done because it it brings itself as a horror movie kind of kind of start where people are turning into monsters and uh-huh. it's not it's it it was really well done. I say what really hurt the most was um, um, Kamen Rider um, Den O, which is one of my favorites, but not mm-hmm. absolutely favorites but it's when they add in in like the fourth wall breaking the the gim like the the personality gimmicks especially with all the characters uh-huh. and each form each forms is based off a kaijin that um uh, could um could uh change the personality of their the, the user uh-huh yeah and to be honest it became the successful the most successful Profit Kamen Rider series, but that's only because it it had a very childish humor kind of uh, round to it, and pretty much from that point on, Toei, a lot of Toei executive, in my honest opinion, I'm not yeah. saying it's fact, yeah. honest opinion, felt like that was the way to go in terms of making a profit. So all uh-huh. the show has been aimed towards a younger demographic than compared to all the earlier Heisei, which right. is aimed towards the older. A demographic right right because kids are more likely to buy the toys more like their parents are most likely oh, to true buy yeah <laughs> the toys for them yeah it's also kind of strange is that i you mentioned before that these are aimed not just at a young demographic but a really young demographic and it was funny because this reminded me of a story of an incident that my my friend had now he is uh um, he helps in English education here in Japan as well, but he works instead of me, who works in like a uh, a company that focuses on teaching English. He works in within like elementary schools as like an assistant English teacher assistant to the main teacher, and so he interacts directly more with children 
in their in those school in you know elementary schools he came across this one child who had like a i think it was like a a pencil case like a sentai pencil super sentai pencil case and he and my friend knowing sentai through me he said oh you like super sentai and the kid got like really embarrassed he's like uh no 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 i i just have this because it it's uh still useful yeah yeah but uh no 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 i'm not i'm not a fan or anything so the kid was like almost embarrassed that someone noticed that he had a a super sentai piece of a piece of super sentai merchandise and he was like in second grade so this tells me that you know, like, second graders are not, like, the main demographic in that it's, like, younger than second graders, second grade elementary school students who primarily enjoy Sentai and most likely uh, Kamen Rider as an extension of that. You sure? Because that sounds more like a common Asian household kind of (laughs) grown-up mentality. I mean, I'm only saying that because uh, me being... I'm not Japanese, but me being Asian myself, I did grow up similarly, like... Um, uh-huh. During my childhood, I never talked about Godzilla. I've never talked about Super Sentai or any mm. of that stuff. I've always kept it to a, a, a quietness around uh-huh. me. Even till now, as an adult, and you know, adult in his uh, nearing his mid thirties, I'm uh-huh. still the same way. I don't really go about and just bring up anything that's related to Tokusatsu or Kaiju related or anything uh-huh. like that. It's it's always more of it's an interest. And I just keep it to myself. Hmm. So, in a sense, I, as when thinking back, I was younger. There was yeah. a lot of times where I was embarrassed, uh-huh. but at the same time, the older I grew, uh, the older I am now, it's like I realized that that was kind of dumb because I was more worried about my um, appearance from other people. Right. Like, um, the thing with me is, uh, my I grew up poor, so uh-huh. we never got any. Um, idea of what was currently new with the world like Uh back in the er late 80s early 90s people were into movies like the predator and Uh aliens and Uh you know um um what is it terminator you know people were really into all that dark stuff Uh what i was watching when everybody was at school talking about that i was watching things that were like way too old for my time i was watching king kong i was watching creature from the black lagoon i was watching uh-huh. wolfman the blob um them it mm-hmm. came beneath the earth i was yeah. watching junk like that <laughs> and these, i'm not trying to say that they're all junk but i'm yeah. saying compared to what a lot of people are watching right. i grew up with stuff like that so so that was all i could and i never been able to talk with anybody because those were all just knowledge that i knew uh-huh. and you know so i just kept it to myself and i was a little embarrassed to be able to talk like if i walked in and people are talking about how t1000 um took all those bullets from arnold and all that junk and i would just be they're like what are you guys talking about and they <laughs> no kid would want to talk to me because i didn't have no idea what they were talking about yeah yeah but but at the same time it's like when it comes to um like even like if a kid was to bring up, it's like, oh, it's just like Godzilla. And then at that motion, you want to talk about Godzilla. And then if I go a little too far, they'll just look at me and be like, it's like, dude, I only, I only use that as a reference. That doesn't mean I like it. Kind of and uh-huh. you feel a little embarrassed about it. Yeah, I guess maybe so, that could be the case. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, personally, I never felt the shame of what I liked. Maybe to a, to a, my own detriment. Um, <laughs> I was kind of like one of those kids where it's like I was always interested in talking about stuff that I like and not thinking about what the other person had in mind. In the con- I didn't think about the other person in the conversation. Uh, oh, you see, like most Asians, especially third world yeah, Asians yeah. or Asian parents from that that come over to America yeah. and um, have you know american born kids yeah. they still carry that mindset of you got to worry about how other people Ooh. see you oh yeah that's and, definitely a big thing in in japanese society as well and yeah and, and the thing is they they carry that and and you grow up conflicted because yeah. a lot of a lot of and it's not just asian kids it's all these other races as well it's like yeah. when you grow, growing up in, up in america there's this struggle that that you try to grow up american mm-hmm. but at the same time you're also being feel like you're being restricted by your own culture so there's this giant uh-huh. culture clash where where you know you're you you have more options if you just you know 
chose to get those options, but you're mm. also held back because you're too busy focusing that you want to keep your tradition. And, and I can that's see that. pretty much the, the, the conflict that goes on with um, a lot of people. Though. Yeah, and I know that off recording, we have talked about how in a lot of these culture, these type of cultures, it's like anything that you're a fan of or anything that you ha- collect or enjoy as a hobby, you kind of keep that shit on the down low. Trust me, if I showed you my room right now, you'll yeah. only see um, three glasses, and that's nothing but uh, monster art figures and three yeah. anime figurines. Like no, everything no, no else, pri- no primal rage characters on yourselves. No primal rage, nothing. It's just everything <laughs> else is locked, and I'm talking about like only the the the, the few nice looking figurines are in my room. Everything yeah. else is in boxes and put away. But uh-huh. I'm not. The thing is. They even thinking about now, I'm not even sure if that's just something that was put into me or mm-hmm. that's just a natural reaction that I normally do. Uh huh. Yeah, like I'm not even sure if, like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I'm not even sure if I should do it. I mean, I've seen other Godzilla fans' yeah. um, rooms and they have all their figurines out, like, boom, right oh, yeah, in your th- face. That, is, that is, like, is me right now as well. Yeah, and it's like some of the most amazingest thing of all uh-huh. i mean i grew up <laughs> like without you, having like, the privilege like, to do that <laughs> like you walk into your into your friend's room and then you hear like the jurassic park theme swell up <laughs> oh yes i mean when i was in college my, how i met my um uh, friend albert yeah when i went inside his room he had nearly the whole complete collection of a lot of the 144 gundam model kits like nice. literally one forty four. That's a like lot the, of them. that's like the smallest kind, right? That they were selling in a lot of Toys R Us's. Back the, in the, the six back. inch, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He had like a good maybe two hundred and seventy of them. Whoa! And he, he and I'm talking about him. He was also collecting the 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 older ones. So oh, he had the okay. high grades. He has the older high grades. Mm. Now, yeah, the very old high grades, and then he right, has right. the older kits. Okay. Like when he showed me the the original Regazi, and I'm like. Holy crap! This thing is garbage. Yeah. I guess, and then, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Then, then there's that new, the new um, high grade Regazi, and I'm like, oh my yeah, god, yeah. this thing is a, a work of beauty. The master grade, those are like the gargantuan ones, right? Uh, master grades are the taller ones. They're one one. They're called one one hundred. Uh-huh. I think the one you're talking about are the perfect grades. They're okay, the cause, the, cause the one. The the bigger ones, yeah. Okay, so there so the scale goes high grade, master grade, perfect, perfect grade, grade, yeah, real grade. No, real grades are still one forty four, I believe. They're just, um, I, I don't know if I don't remember because I haven't collected gun and model kits in a long time. Okay, because I'm assuming that high grade is just like the the basic scale for the majority of these model kits. Yeah, high grades are the one forty four. The one forty four kits are the 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 standard mo- um, size, size for a lot of the Gundam kits. They're like okay. twelve dollars, seven dollars sometimes. Right, right. Okay, then. Yeah, you know what? I I, I do want. I think I, maybe I mentioned this before on another recording, but um, I love model kits, but I'm not a model kit maker myself. It's like I have a <laughs> lot of love and appreciation for the people who have the talent to put stuff like that together, but I could never have the patience nor the artistic merit to put together a full model kit and paint it and do the lines and the stickers and all that stuff. That's why I always I... love the Robot Damashi line. Don't worry. I mean, um, some of the last model kits I did was the Armor Core model kits. Kotobukiya. <laughs> Let me tell you, touching a Kotobukiya kit once, uh-huh. you never want to touch it again. And that also includes <laughs> all the Super Robot Tyson original character lines, too. Mm. Like, uh... Yeah, yeah. Like the uh, the one that was hardest for me mm-hmm. isn't the nine ball. Is not the nine balls. Uh, even its upgrade nine ball. I I've built those. The the hardest one for me that I hated the most yeah. was white glint from Armor Core Four. That thing is such a beauty. But my God, had that thing had so much peace. Hmm. I mean, these, these uh, yeah, plastic yeah. kits were, like, made different from the standard Bandai's. They, they're they just so many pieces, and a lot okay. of them are sharp that could pierce you, too. Ouch. So it's like, hmm, I see. So, like, going moving a little bit away from the, mul- from the, uh, the model kits, when it comes to the actual, like, figure lines, 
Uh, which has some been your favorite when it came, comes to robot figures? Like, be it like Robot Spirits or Chagokin, Super Robot Chagokin or Rebel Tech or anything else? I wish Rebel Tech could do more than the their, what they're limited to. Because I mm-hmm. feel like a lot of the, the ones that they produce are usually just handpicked. And I understand it's like they only picked it the ones that sells well. Yeah. But uh, the quality for the Rebel Techs is well done. I love them. Mm-hmm. Um. The Chogogans, I love, but I am not going to spend that much money on it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean to tell me you don't want to spend like 90, 70 to 90 bucks on a Mazinger Z that can transform into a giant fist? I actually have that. Oh, nice. You do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm thinking about the uh, ones that are probably, oh, like the Big O. The Big O was like $200, I think, or 300 Yeah, I did not want to buy it's that. Like, I love the Big O, but God damn it. Why do you have to do this to me? Why do you got to torture me with that? Or it's like uh, the... You know what? I have yet to see a Megazord at a hobby shop here in Japan. Maybe I haven't done that much searching, but I would love to have that as my next. I like so far in terms of Chogokins, all I have is Mazinger Z, and it's like like a basic set version of him that comes with like an extra f- that silver fist with a spike collar around um, wrist collar and the uh, sword. Oh, um, a uh, one that I want. One figurine that I do want is the Dino Getters. My oh, God, I forgot I there those. is the they do that does exist, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, the Dinosaur Getters. I want those, but I am not going to pay the price for that. They're <laughs> asking for it. Yeah, wasn't like the Dino Getter. I'm not sure if it was like the manga was made to promote the toy, or was the toy meant to promote that manga? There was a manga. I think so. That explained where this Dino Getter. I thought Getter it was just a toy line. From. I think... I thought it was just a toy line. You know what? I could be wrong, but all I know is that there was a storyline attached to Dino Getter in where it's like in this alternate retelling of the story, the dinosaur empire has taken over the world. So the main Getter pilots get their their main rope Dino Getter from uh, rebuilt pieces of of uh, stolen the dinosaur machines of stolen dinosaur machine technology. Wow, so that's it's crazy. Like, so the Dino Getter <laughs> is repurposed technology from the Dinosaur Empire. Uh, wow. Yeah, so in a way, it's like fighting fire with fire. That is an interesting backstory, to be honest. Yeah, but that doesn't matter now, because now we got Get a Robo Devolution. <laughs> oh my god. Then again, I want to see that new Mazinger movie. Yes, yes, me too. Uh, you know what? Uh, how's... Uh, let's see. I do. I also want to, would love to get a, a Chagokin figure of the uh, uh, Alt Ison. I don't have any figurines except for the the Kotobukiya model kit. Uh, and but then, I don't only have the regular ones. I only have Alt Ison Reese. Mm. And let's see. Did the robot uh, from from uh, Virtual On, a uh, Temjin? Did he ever get a figure? He has a lot of figures. Oh, okay. But wonder... they're more they're kind of more closer to uh Figma or the Revoltec lines. So they're they're, like... they're very posable. Okay, but they're also like much more smaller, I'm assuming. Like more fragile. Yeah, very small. Okay. They're then. Like low, smaller, maybe five five feet? No, five yeah. inches, I mean. Five okay. inches. So I guess since we're already delved into the subject of giant robots, uh, what would you say has been your introduction to giant robot media? Since we already talked about, we've gone at lengths when it comes to monsters, Sentai, Ultraman, and the Common Rider. Um, let's see. My first memory of uh, any of the robot series is um, in English. When I watched it in America, it was um, Macron One. In Ooh. Japan, everybody knows him as Go Shogun. Okay. And uh, he was my first introduction to um, combining Super Robot, mm-hmm. and as well as a Super Robot that that includes um, a transformation scenes where all the planes goes into um, all the all the pilots goes into the um, main robot. Okay, um, I've seen this guy before in Super Robot Wars. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's a, the weird thing is I've always known him as his English name and when I first played Super Robo I didn't know about that his real name until like years later yeah but no but it's going back it's like yeah that was my first introduction to um, mech animation um, I didn't really think much about that and then um, eventually I 
eventually led to uh, Transformer, and I did watch a few of um, Transformer and whatever GoBots. Yeah. I know they were kind of <laughs> like the rival of Transformer, but it was right, kind of right. done shitty. Yeah, they were they were the they were the uh... they were Hanna Barbera, right? Uh, no, I don't. Th- maybe, yeah, yeah. Let me just check. I know their animation was garbage. That's all I remember. <laughs> Um, but the, yeah, they were the, they were like the transformer toys that you were too cheap to get, go to the local toy shop too. So you have to go to the, the 99 cent shop and get those things instead. Yeah, exactly. Now I remember that a lot. I mean, heck, I'm one of those losers who did that. I'm still proud <laughs> or, of that. You go to like, what do you call it? Not even like the 99 cent shop. You go to like the, I don't know, like the, 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 I guess the equivalent of a Vons back in the day that had like, didn't really have <laughs> a real toy section. It was just a bunch of cheapo toys. Or, uh, or even like when you call or it a pharmacy, the, uh, a pharmacy. You go to a pharmacy and they have like a, a dollar there you store. Know, yeah, there's back like the TBS will save ons. Yeah, yeah, TBS save ons, Vons, whatever. There's like this really or uh, a pharmacy that has like a single shelf of like these cheap plastic toys for like five dollars. Yeah, I remember that. That's Good where times. you get. That's where you get your GoBots. <laughs> <laughs> that's where you go for when you but when you. Before that, I never knew they were called GoBots. I just kind of like it's a mech. I want it. That's it. That was yeah. my that was my <laughs> my mindset uh, my mindset throughout uh, my childhood. Right. Um, Let's see. Still looking to see it, who made. But a... huh? Sorry. Okay, this was Hanna Barbera that made Challenge of the GoBots. Oh. Yeah, it was it was garbage. I didn't I didn't really <laughs> like the show, but I, I remember collecting the toys. Yeah, yeah. Um, eventually, I stumbled upon the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Okay, well, where would you find that? Um, it was Chinese dub at a Hong Kong swamp meet or ah, a, a okay. Chinatown swamp meet. Yeah, yeah, the best place for all your for all the good Japanese stuff that's not when available I was in watching America. Dragon Ball. Yeah. See. That was pretty much how you get all your shows. You didn't understand uh, what they were saying, but yeah. you could straight out say you've seen it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you know that childish that childish mentality is like I saw it first. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, that's how it was like during my time in high school when Naruto was at its peak, uh, where it's like oh, did you, or ble- <laughs> Naruto and Bleach mostly, where it's like I saw the latest episode before it even came out in America. <gasps> Whoa! You must be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you gotta think back to those kids days oh my yeah. it's like you think back it's like wow what a dumbass <laughs> but no it's like i i went i saw um gundam that way but then again i didn't really see um i didn't really had a hook for a mech still i yeah. i just kind of like saw it. it it was cartoons it was cool i uh-huh. just i just Saw it that way. And it wasn't even the TV series. It was one of the three movies. I don't remember which movie, uh-huh. but it was one of the three movies. Uh-huh. And then um, after that, it was straight Transformer all the way. Mm, okay. So it was like Transformers that really brought you into the world of mechs? Uh, it, more like it caught my attention because I was really into the whole um, mech designs. Yeah. I mean, my love for mechs always comes with mech designs first, uh-huh. then the show, uh-huh. and then than you know everything else but it's uh-huh. always what attracts me is the mech designs and if i like the mech design i'll sit there and watch it like um yeah that's generally me as well i mean that could make, yeah. make me sound shallow but really you're there for the robots like that's like the main appeal of the story even with yeah. gundam as great as those stories are the thing that draws you in are like those stylish designs Exactly. Um, another, um, like a good, I'll I'll use you a good, I'll use a good example of a mech series that turned me off uh-huh. from that show alone. Uh-huh. The Tatsunoko's Gold Lighten. Okay. Yeah, I do yeah. not give a damn about a giant gold brick that turns into a giant bot. I, I <laughs> give a ass. gold brick that turns into a bigger gold br- a gold brick with arms and legs. <laughs> yes. Um, I did grow grow up on Voltron. Yeah, and I hate to say this to a lot of people who might get mad at me, but uh-huh. Voltron has a better story than Gold Lion. No and ifs or buts on my end. That's that's mm. ca- that's all I saw. I okay. mean, Gold Lion is darker. There's more violence and stuff, but Voltron in itself has always had the better story in my eyes. But maybe that's just a kid in me. I Even tr- the new, I, tr- I tried looking. Huh? I tried rewatching Voltron like the first couple episodes. And it's like, I don't know, there were clearly, I think it was like mostly the editing 
and the bad voice acting and like the awkward dialogue that for me that's kind of like ooh this has not aged well but you know that's no just me. It's, none of those shows age well no. <laughs> or age well there's this part where this where um the characters stumble upon a pile of human bones and uh the main character he like does a little prayer for them and you can clearly clearly tell he's like giving you respect for the those lost souls and he's like and while he's doing that praying pose the English dialogue is like, I hope we make it out of here in time. It's like, uh, I don't think that fits <laughs> with what you're doing right now. See, that's that's just you're, – you, you were a kid. You didn't know anything. No, you just right, kind of right. like sat there and watched it. That's yeah, all yeah, you yeah. did. Exactly. But anyways, as you were saying – yeah, it's like to me. It's like um, from my understanding with Go Lion, like the yeah. the new. I mean, Voltron, the new one. Oh yeah, the the Netflix very one. nicely done. For, yes, and they were limited on what they could do, and I I admit that was that is probably the best Voltron story I've ever I've ever seen come, and it pretty much became my favorite Voltron show. Uh huh. I mean, like I said, I liked the new Voltron show uh -huh. much better than the um, Go Lion, the original. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you ever saw what was it called Voltron Force? That CGI one. I did not like that one. Okay, because I, I I barely know anyone who saw it. No, I saw uh, it. There was another one too. Uh, was it called Voltron? Ooh, Voltron: The Third Dimension. There you go. That's the one the I third, grew. I grew third, up with that one and the original. <laughs> and they introduced us uh, uh, Stealth Voltron. God, yeah. that was. I had the toy for Dino Voltron, and that toy was a piece of shit because the moment you took it out of the box, the paint was already chipping off. <laughs> okay, that's some terrible quality right there. Did you ever saw a Dino Voltron? I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Apparently that was yeah. going to be from, like, another season. Like, had Voltron the Third Dimension been given, like, another season, they would have had, like, Voltron change its form depending on, like, what planet or what dimension he was in. To, that like, was <laughs> uh, I like the original concept. Just take um, another Tatsunoko own ro Super Robot and just name it Voltron something. Because I know that the the, vo the original TV Voltron story, Voltron was number three. Um, Dai Ruger was number two, yeah. and I forgot what was number one. And I get the feeling it, it might have been um, God Sigma, the one I showed you uh, a while back. Ah, uh, and by the way, here I found an image for uh, Dino Voltron. All right. <laughs> That's so bad. It's as bad as um um Stealth Voltron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that 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 3D anime um that 3D cartoon or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I think that was like the mistake of Voltron. <laughs> I think it was more pressure because a lot there were a lot of Voltron fans who just kept on asking for more. Yeah, I mean, I used to like it as in back in the day where it's like, whoa, cool, it's all in CGI, it's new and awesome. I'm afraid to look back at that show and see how it holds up. <laughs> like, at least with, thank God, at least something with, with something like Transformer, no, Beast Wars, it's okay for the dated CGI because they're robots, so they're supposed to look shiny and angular. But with, with Voltron, I'm afraid to see what those characters even look like in, in C nowadays. To be honest, I'm even afraid of going back to watch Beast Wars because I grew up. It had it had a good memory on my life. I kind of mm -hmm. don't want to go back and ruin my image by saying, "Oh my <laughs> God, look at those stupid jokes." Did they actually? Make a actually, I went back and watched the first couple episodes of Beast Wars, and it still drew me in like I was when I was a kid, if not more so, because I was more focused on the character development. It's weird because I'm a big fan of the first two episodes. Those first two episodes was the best. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I also got mad when the later seasons when they killed off Pterosaur. And I'm like, he was funny. <laughs> yeah, right. It was weird because they gave him an upgrade in toy form, but he never got that upgrade. Instead, he was he was killed off. The trend mass, uh, the trans metal. Trans metal, yeah. yeah. No, let me tell what's another one I was disappointed on. I was disappointed that they killed off Scorponox. Right, right. Scorponox died also. I mean, I, I granted we got we got Inferno, and I loved his. Yes, my queen. Kind of comments with Megatron. I mean, that was that's right. adorable. But it's like, <laughs> I'm just kind of like, okay. Um, I love this Scorponox. He actually was a lovable Predacon. Yeah, yeah. He was uh, short too. That's what I also like about him. He was short. <laughs> the guy uh, can relate to him. 
<laughs> hey, I see what you did there. <laughs> now that was a blind. That was a blind, like a joke on the blind side because I didn't. I don't know how tall you are. <laughs> I'm five seven. I'm not that small. Oh no, I'm 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 that height as well. Oh, okay, yeah. And, Mex- um, us Mexicans are not known for our tall statures. Yes. So, uh, do you also bounce when Denny throws you? <laughs> <laughs> I like to see him try to catch me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's like the the my my love uh, for Beast Wars is yeah. I like the first. I believe the first two season where they're animal. Mm-hmm. Once they bring in the whole transmetal thing, I felt like the season went downhill. That, that's really? my honest opinion, though. But it's like okay. I felt like it went downhill because mm-hmm. uh, it's also a good turning point too. Mm-hmm. I, I would like to say, but for me, it went kind of downhill. And um, d- don't get me wrong, I did watch Beast Machines. Uh-huh. I did like the way it ended too. Uh huh. And it's like to me, it's like, oh my god, they gave Waspinator the last line of the whole thing. <laughs> Waspinator Perfect. never gets what Waspinator wants. He was the best. I mean, <laughs> hell, I mean, the first time I fell in love with Waspinator is when Starscream came back and took over his body. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah, uh, but see, I never really saw Waspinator as anything more than Waspinator. And then when they started <laughs> making him like a joke, that's yeah. when I fell in love with him. I mm. loved him from there. What was what was always weird weird about beast beast machines is that like for me I've never really grew to like those designs, but what's even weirder is that the toys never matched what the they looked like in the show. The toys were much better uh, in my honest opinion. Kind of yeah yeah. Although from what I hear there was like a huge, um, in most Transformer shows they make the t- the designs into toys then they make them into, um, I guess they make the toys before they make them in animation but here it's like they made him in animation and then the toys had to desperately try to follow what what the heck the creators were think making for that show i could see that um but no if i was to be honest with beast machine i wasn't a fan of beast machine i don't know why it was mm. i think it was just that whole organic thing that just kind of uh-huh i never really liked it uh-huh and also, it's kind of weird because it kind of retcons the whole idea of Cybertron being a planet for robots and a machine planet for machine organisms. Yeah, that that threw me off, too. Yeah. Okay, then. And then, let's see. Uh, we should be wrapping up pretty soon. But before we head off, uh, what has been... Uh, some, we talked. You talked a little bit about Gundam and how you grew up with that. I'm um, assuming you also grew up with the shows when they came to Toonami? The weird thing is, uh, yeah, I um, I knew of Gundam Wing. I've seen Gundam Wing way before it came up on Toonami. Mm-hmm. There goes that little ch- childish ego again. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I did like, I did enjoy the. I, the Gu- in- I, I liked Gundam before it was cool. <laughs> I did like the dub, the dubbing for that. Uh, that was given for Gundam Gundam yeah. Wing, to be honest. And I like yeah. the fact that at night they showed the uncut ones. Mm, oh, yeah, that's right. They did do that. Yeah, and, you know, it's like instead of calling um, um, Death Sight, Death Sight Hell, it's just Death Sight H. And I'm, I, I, that yeah. always... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, or or how they were dubs um, the God of Death to the Great Destroyer. That always bugged me, too. Oh, uh, yeah, that also, that's also true. Oh, who was but, the, what was the company that did the dub for that show? Uh, the Ocean Group. Oh, that was Ocean. Oh, right, right, because they were kind of like the most prominent group before like the likes of Viz Media and Funimation came in. Yeah. Um, then again, uh, back in the nineties, I think Pioneer did better dubbings than any other places. But that's there, just me. There was also Manga Entertainment, right? Is that a dub company or is that simply a distribution company? I think that's just a distribution company. Okay, so they most likely went to like Ocean or something like – or Pioneer. Yeah, I remember because they were the one that, that uh, got away f- um, from – Macross uh, Plus? Harmonies. Yep, Macross Plus, Macross 2, and it's like kind of a big fing- middle finger to Gold Harmony. Yeah, fuck you, Gold Harmony. Uh, no, Anyways, har- um, har- Harmony Gold. <laughs> uh, Harmony Gold, yeah. Yeah. It's like um, – Ro- or Macross doesn't exist outside of Robotech, everybody. Don't pay attention to that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Macross fan over Robotech. That's uh-huh. I'm, I, I can't stand Robotech for some reason. Okay. Yeah. 
But then again, my view takes on uh, Matt Cross is probably different because I've noticed a lot of people who mm -hmm. enjoys Matt Cross uh -huh. also has a lot of things that they carry from um, when they were watching um, Robotech, which to me is like it's not bad. But in terms of discussion, when it comes uh -huh. to Matt Cross shows, there's a difference in culture right there. In, oh, in yeah. View in fact, there's a video um, made by an individual um, called Quentin Reviews, and he made a video who, like, he's a big Robotech fan, and he made a video comparing, like, the cultural differences between how Americans view Mac Robotech and how the Japanese view um, Macross, and especially when it comes to the character of Lin Minmei, where, like, she's this idol character, and she's kind of like a celebration of Japanese idol culture, whereas in America, we just kind of see that as a simple... Uh, representation of pop star uh, status, as opposed to yeah, and the thing status. is, she's, yeah, and the thing is, she's more hated in America than she is in Japan, where she's actually adored. Right, right, exactly. And the fact is that pop star piece of she only played like a she. The whole show wasn't focused on her, but she did play an important role in the grand scheme of things. And it was because of that that in late, from what I understand, in later Macross shows, they put a lot more focus on the. Um, idol on the on the idol uh, factor. Meanwhile, with Americans, I, we kind of I think say it's more with Macross is uh, I like to say there's always a triangle. Each Macross mm -hmm. series, there's always a love triangle, and that's kind uh -huh. of a uh, a common thing. But yeah, go on. Okay, but whereas Americans, when we interpret Robotech, we kind of see it as a space drama, less about the the love triangle stuff. Like the love triangle stuff, I'm sure that a lot of people were engaged to that. But they were like, if we want to see more Robotech, we want to see more of humans versus aliens, not more love triangles, which I guess is why, like, of course, people then grew up with uh, Southern Cross and Mos Pieta in the forms of the second and third uh, portions of Robotech. So that's why looking at Robotech as a whole, that whole love triangle pop idol thing, that was only like a small piece of the bigger story for Americans. Meanwhile, for Japanese, all they have are like the love triangles and the music and the l idol st culture. Yeah, and the, the whole mech thing was just a side thing in, to a lot of the the people who watches that, which is funny because yeah, like you said, it's like there's that giant twist. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, I do want to share with you that if you have your own time, where it's like this, the video uh, was called like why I won't watch or why I'm not interested in the other Macross shows. And the guy, he was very, um, Quentin, he was very respectful to the Japanese shows. He's just like, looking at this, it doesn't really feel like it's my thing because I'm more of a fan of Robotech, not really Yeah, actually, really yeah, uh, uh, link that for me um, after the ca the podcast because quite honestly, I'm, I'm really open-minded when it comes to stuff like that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. So, uh, oh yeah, the video is called Why the Macross Sequels Don't Interest Me by Quentin Reviews. Uh, I found the video, so yeah, I'll save that for later. Now, um, through your experiences with mecha anime or just mech media in general, what have been some of your like standout favorites that you have grown to love over the years? Um, the let's just say a lot of the ones that a lot of people don't know or majority of the people won't recognize are uh -huh. all what Sunrise called the Yusha series. Yusha. The the, the 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 most popular ones that are of the Yusa series that everybody remembers is Gal Gai Gar. Oh yeah, all oh, the Brave but, series, yeah. Yes, and then there's the the to me it's like my favorite of the the Yusha series is um, Mike Gain. Mike Gain, okay. Yes, he's pretty much think if if um, Bruce Wayne didn't be didn't wasn't interested in Bat but was more interested in Train. That's pretty much Mike Gain is. Okay then, yeah, yeah. And then um, there's also another series, uh, another line that's part of the Sunrise series mm -hmm. was the Elderon series. Okay. And uh, there, they, they, they could the 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 thing that that I'm I'm not sure if I'm calling it right, but the thing that bothers me is I think that I sometimes get them mixed up with the the Yusha series because the the mech design looks the same. Uh huh. And or then there's they, one they, that they all I, have that like similar angular transformers that anime obari aesthetic. Look, yeah obari. they have that okay. obari design um so which ones did obari actually worked on 
He worked on a lot. Okay. Um, so he was very But that, that humanoid face, that talkative humanoid face that you see in all the Yusha series, okay. that is a style that I, I, I would like to say that Obari kind of signify as his, his, his style. Okay. So the, what I like to call the Transformers face. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, like a good example would be um, uh, of his close up and his sharpness is um, uh-huh. Dan Guy. Dan oh. Guy. Okay. Yeah. If he, it's like it's 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 like um, animation wise, it's very powerful. Um, there's uh-huh. a lot of stuff that that he's known for, but he hasn't he didn't create. Like a good example would be um, mm-hmm. Dan Cougar. Dan Cougar, the TV itself, when you watch it, it looks like you know the typical '80s stuff. I say it aged as well as uh, El Gaim. Okay. Or heavy metal El Gaim and Oro Battler Dumbine. Mm-hmm. But when Obari did um, Gao Gai, uh, Dan Cougar final. Uh huh. My God, he made that beast look beautiful. Mm. Like very sharper. The wings are bigger. He, mm-hmm. uh, certain pieces are over exaggerated. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's like um, a lot of these mech series that stands mm. out are pretty much what I've named. Um, okay, so you're really into like the eighty style super robot anime. Yeah, because I know that there was this weird slum during the nineties where. After Ava, a lot of the stuff that came afterward was just like this, uh, you know, the typical Gundam X, Gundam, Gundam, mm. um, Gundam Wing, and the G Gundams. Right. And they were very well received, but um, the the interest of Mech was kind of dying down from then. Yeah. At least from true. my opinion of it. Yeah. I kind of noticed that too. And surprisingly, I don't, I feel like we don't really get a lot of new Mech stuff. Outside of like your annual or or uh, your annual Gundam material, well, uh, the thing is, there is a lot of newer mech stuff, but it's hard for it to stand out compared to the big name. And it also doesn't really help that a lot of these newer mech stuff kind of mm-hmm. falls flat down because of terrible directions or just terrible uh-huh. storytelling. Like I'll give you a good a good one of the yeah. past years is um, uh, Valve Rave. Uh-huh. Mech designs are beautiful. Um, um, story concept not so great. And while the mechs were well received, uh-huh. the show itself became garbage, and the writing just kind of went to shit afterwards. What is Another your, one. What uh, is your opinion on Knights of Sidonia? My opinion of Knights of Sedona, uh, Sidonia is I like it. I don't really hate it. Mm-hmm. I like the that dark hardcore fantasy that it introduced like yeah it's not even i don't even want to it's sci-fi fantasy mm. yeah but i would like to say it's part of like that hardcore medieval fantasy but it's more the sci-fi version okay. like it's all gray it's dark but at the same time a lot of the characters are kind of feels very human yeah and i know that a lot of people didn't like the introduction of that uh that uh, organic female yeah that, <laughs> that was weird but i grew to like her um no uh actually a lot of people hate her so much that mm-hmm. it's kind of the downfall of that whole show like mm. people people who who reads up on the manga eventually just a good portion of them just stop from what i was told mm. like they just literally stop because of that creature uh, i wonder if they're ever going to make a season three based off further material from the manga I'm kind of curious about that myself because it wasn't that bad or in my my honest opinion, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What about that new one that's apparently coming to Netflix, um, ID Zero? That just – that came out in Japan a while ago though. Oh, OK. I guess it's coming to Japan – to uh, Netflix soon. Um, It's <laughs> a mixed <laughs> series but I yeah. don't know how to explain because it's – It's not really – it's just a, a series that just so happens to have a mech in it. No, the the mech is the main character. Okay. Um, they're AI controlled. Think Transformer. Okay. But they're human personality that gets adapted into it. Okay. Uh, the thing is, it's it's kind of hard for me to judge it as a mech series because it's doesn't feel like a mech series, even though it takes it. Every, uh, there's mechs in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I don't know. It's it's kind of more of those conspiracy type animation that also has a um, 
action scene in it. But I do like right. the twist. Like the the biggest surprise in me when I was watching ID Zero or mm-hmm. Ido yeah. was um the the a lot of there was like a lot of plot twist inside, especially when um mm-hmm. I won't spoil it, but especially when you find out who the main robot is. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, then. Also, the main robot. Just, it's funny. When my friends showed me this robot, they were like, uh, Andres, I hate to tell you this, but uh, there's this thing here that looks an awful lot like Draco Azul. I see this robot. I'm like, God fucking damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was going to be the first one to have a robot with a red scarf. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. You want you want me to you want me to feel bad? Raptor <laughs> Gear yeah. has this this spear yeah. that is pretty much it's it's not a straight spear like it's in certain uh, it it could be programmed to be a spear yeah but on its time it's connected to the back of raptor gear yeah. and it turns into uh, some sort of tail uh-huh. when i saw barbados lupus rex had his tail pop up oh. i was like son of a bitch <laughs> they, they 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 happened to have the same idea and made it better than what i had <laughs> So if you're gonna get mad at I, uh, Ido with him yeah. having a red scarf and he's blue and white, yeah. that was my reaction with Barbados Lupus Rex. I was like, yeah. when he popped that that shield that's located in, like right behind is the same place I have the javelin yeah. equipped with the the Raptor gear, and he was using it like a freaking badass tail. I'm yeah. like, son of a bitch! <laughs> no, uh, you no. Know what? What's worse, <laughs> boss? They made it better than my original idea. <laughs> You know what, as long as you can just, in in terms of execution, as long as you can execute it in a way where it's like, it's oh, it's your own thing, hopefully people will make that many comparisons. I mean, if if you can have Gal Gygar get away with a variation of the Rocket Punch, if any robot can get away with a variation of the Rocket Punch from Mazinger Z, I think we're safe, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, lucky enough. As ID's... long as we give it a different name, there yeah. you go. <laughs> uh, like, uh, uh, luckily, ID for me, ID Zero is not that well known in America, so I'm sure not a lot of people have seen a lot of scarved blue robots with red scarves. But Andreas, yeah, I know who he is. That's <laughs> different. <laughs> when you told me that, I was like, I know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, you know that I've had Draco Zul much longer than these people have. <laughs> yes. They can go back to 2014 and they can see when I first revealed Draco Azul on my YouTube. Well, on the, to on be the honest, first... my, yeah. my opinion of I, uh, Ido, Ido is yeah. um, he's doesn't even look close to yours. Like, then that's, again, that's, that's a only good because. Th- that's a good that's, thing. <laughs> that's only because I've seen enough mech to see the difference. <laughs> that, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I'm going more with the retro 70s Go Nagai look, Ken yep. uh, Ishikawa Go Nagai look. Whereas this one is just like a skeletal robot that's kind of typical of modern mech designs, where they're like very skinny, agile looking, and angular. Yeah. Oh, another good mech series that. Mm-hmm. Okay, if I, I'm not going to say good mech series, but in terms uh-huh. of action, I liked was uh, the Majestic Prince um, animation. Majestic Prince, okay. Never heard um, of that one. The character designer is the same character designers of Gundam Seed, but honestly, okay. I can never get into the story. Like, I just felt like the star, for me at least, the story was garbage. Uh-huh. But my God, it has some of the best choreographed mech fights I've ever seen. Hmm. These are all like hand to hand combat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. So yeah, it's, I I never really watched it for the story. I just kind of like I just want to see the mech fights because whoever animated or the the 3D animation company that animated that mech fight those mech fights yeah are really well done. Oh nice. Um, what is your opinion on an Eureka Seven? Because I've seen that pop up a lot of, a lot recently, especially on Toonami, but never had the chance to check it out. You mean the mech with the surfboard? Yes. Um, let's see. Eureka Seven. I'm a. I'm not gonna say I'm a fan, but I love it. I love it enough to the point where I. Um, a lot of the things from Eureka Seven, um, get stuck on me. Like I do like the the music. I do like the the um, the the main backstory of why there's there's the planet that they have. Mm-hmm. But I also felt like the. It went downhill as soon as the sequel was um, introduced because that sequel was so hated that it uh-huh. ended pretty the franchise. bad. Like, yeah, it, it kind of 
in a sense, yeah, it kind of destroyed the franchise because it's, it's when seen, I saw it, the it's seen Destiny the franchise. Yes, because when I saw the the sequel, yeah, I honestly I didn't think it was that bad, but yeah. for to a lot of fans, it was that bad. Uh huh. And then when and then when the 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 main mech started talking, I'm like, what? When did this happen? <laughs> but in terms of uh, my interest for Eureka Seven is. Mm-hmm. Um, actually from video games and they're all from the Van Pesto games like mm-hmm. uh, my favorite my favorite uses of him was would probably be um, uh, Ace 3 or Another Century Ep 3 episode or Another ah. Century Episode 3 Which where they like, introduce yeah 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 where they introduce um, um, the I forgot what the main mech is called but mm-hmm. um where you could use him and you could actually do a lot of the flips and like skydiving stuff oh, in nice. that game. Cool, cool. In the middle of battle too. Yeah. Now, if only they can get some of the old school, me- more old school mechs in that series, then I- I'd be more interested. Well, you gotta, you have to understand that that series is usually limited on um, real robots and in occasional Bullshit. super <laughs> <intros>. <laughs> Like Getter OVA and Aquarion. See, so in a sense, it's like those are the only two super robots that has been introduced (laughs) in that series. Yeah. Which is like, again, again, bullshit, I say, because I want a third person action game um, where I can use, I can control these robots, not just (laughs) turn based RPG stuff where I get to see some set animations, impressive animations. But I want something more than that, damn it. (laughs) Yeah, like that in Other Century Episode 3. It's like, it's third. Third, yeah. uh, third person a- or, mech action or uh, Super Robot Wars original generation infinite battle but more cleaned up <laughs> but that was more of a fighting game though or kind true. of a fighting game true to me yeah. it was it was like the answer to um, the Gundam versus game kind of oh yeah yeah definitely it was like a cheaper version of uh, of the Gundam versus game, you know what? I, I do have to say, did you ever found it weird whenever a, car- a robot would fall to the ground? They f- they don't hit the ground. They like bounce off the ground, do a f- cartwheel flip, and then land on the ground it before they explode. See, that's the technology of, or no, I wouldn't say technology. That is the power of Bandai's budget games. Ah <laughs> uh, yes, PS3, PS4 games running on PS2 engines. Yep. Genius, brilliant uh, tactics there, Man Presto or Bandai. I'm going to blame Bandai. <laughs> it's all Bandai's problems. It's all Bandai. Like, Bandai is like, like we're going to charge you dearly, but give you a cheaper quality. Yeah, like yeah. all the Kamen Rider <laughs> games, such garbage. Yeah. They, I, have, I, didn't, they, I, I bought Climax Heroes, but I'm not, a, I'm not ready to – I have yet to play it. But looking at the you trailers, mean, I thought I thought it was Battle Ride. No, that was last year's. That was the oh, Dynasty okay. Warriors style game. This oh, okay. year is Climax Heroes. But yeah, um, Batride War Genesis was very low budget looking. And I got it for the PS2. For, it's for the PS3, Three. PS Vita, yeah. and PS4. I got the PS4 thinking that it would run the smoothest. But no, it's still like 30 frames per second. Yeah, like I said, that's that's kind of an issue with... Um... Bandai, why? Why do you think it's it's kind of bugs? It's kind of surprised me that they end up, they stop making Super Sentai games altogether. That's true. In fact, the, um, a lot of the older games until now have only been for the 3DS and DS. Yeah, all, all handheld. None of none of the console games. And it, and the only time there's a console game is this Kamen Rider. Like the last console game we got for Power Rangers was like, um, what's it called, Mega Battle? But that was like clearly a low budget effort, flash looking game. Was that the one where they're supposed to go into that weird generation that was made for the PS2? No, um, this was a new game for the PS4 you can download. Oh, it's a downloadable title. It's a downloadable title that it's like up to four player um, co-op, beat-em-up sites, and then it's like all quick time event Megazord battles. Oh, just like the Voltron game and uh, the, okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All That's right, kind of disappointing. Yeah. Well, let's see. I think we've gone on for about, oh, yeah, we're definitely past two and a half hours. So now <laughs> we should be wrapping things up right about now. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve, or uh, Raptor Gear, as you heard known on online. Thank you very, very much. I really enjoyed um, 
this conversation with you and being able to just discuss all matters of tokusatsu and mecha anime and of course your own experiences in the field of art um is there anything you would like to promote uh before we uh say our goodbyes to the audience uh i have nothing at the moment but i will eventually open up a uh, personal website where i'm gonna basically host a lot of the four comas that i've been doing and mm-hmm. a lot of them will consist of kaiju or things that's related to um of course my mascot mm-hmm. and um I will open up commission eventually in the future again, but most of my commission will probably be, again, what you see. A good example is what you guys are seeing right now. It's, it's, mm-hmm. It'll most likely be a very simple open commission that I probably won't even charge that much for. Okay, and you can be sure to check out a recent commission I made him do exclusively for the Draco Azul Primal Warrior Draco Azul comic that I am currently making right now with Tyler Souls, who you may know as the artist behind Durantis the Lost Serpent, along with my colorist um, Ed Peary, who is the uh, a colorist you may know, uh, an artist you may know on DeviantArt as King Goji, and with my cover, cover artist uh, James Biggie, who you would know as the writer and cover artist for a uh, cover artist for IDW, as well as the writer and co-creator of Robot God of Komatsu. So, I recently um, had collaborated with a popular Godzilla YouTuber by the name of Dman 1954, who recently did a promo for my upcoming comic, and you can check that on his channel, where you can get a first look at the art, the story, and the concept art. And uh, finally, you can check out the official uh, pay, uh, Facebook page I opened for Primal Warrior Draco Azul. So be sure to check out all of that and more. So once again, thank you very much, Steve, for being Thanks on the channel. Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I, can, I look forward to having more collaborations like this down the line where we can discuss <laughs> further at length about <laughs> any topic we, uh, we so desire. So... <laughs> to wrap things up, I have been Andres Perez, aka Kaiju Noir, and you have been Steve here, Raptor Gear. And until next time, everybody, take care. Gundam Fight Hall set! Ready? Go! go!